Hey guys. This is what if Naruto was Luffy's sister. The Straw Hats knew that Luffy had an older brother, who was Ace. But at that time, they were not aware of the existence of yet another brother or even Luffy's supposed older sister. His mysterious older sister who apparently could walk on water and make a bunch of copies of herself. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. We are pain, that's all. We are God. Chapter 1 Prologue It was a normal day for the Straw Hats. The weather was nice, the sky was a beautiful shade of blue without a single cloud on sight, and even the sea was calm as it mirrored the beautiful sky on its surface. On the newly built Thousand Sunny, a beautiful melody of a violin being played which was accompanied by the sound of a happy laughter could be heard ringing throughout the whole ship. The straw hats had just sailed away from the mysterious Florian Triangle, and were now on their way to their next destination. It had been a few days after the crew's battle against one of the Sichibukai, Gekko Moria. Despite the many challenging and horrifying experiences that not only drained them out physically but also mentally, Luffy and the others managed to beat the odds and came out victorious at the end of the day. Defeating a Sichibukai was definitely one of the crew's greatest achievements so far. Not only did they survive a battle against the Sichibukai, but they also gained a new crew member along the way. Brooke was the name of their new comrade. Unlike a normal human being, Brooke was a man who died before coming back to the world of the living from the underworld thanks to the ability of his devil fruit. But he also remained as a skeleton due to the fact that his soul took such a long time to find his body back. And when he did, all that was left of him was just bones and his afro hair that he was very proud of. So yes, adding to the crew's list of unusual members, Brooke was the living skeleton that the crew first encountered in the mysterious Florian Triangle. Once the battle was over, the crew had a party to celebrate their victory with some of the survivors of Thriller Bark and it could be said that the one who was most happy and excited at the end of the day was Nami, the money-loving woman. The orange-haired navigator was so happy when she found so many treasures on the ship, even though she knew that it wasn't the work of any of the members in the crew. But would she care? Absolutely not. Recovering from her state of drooling over her treasures, the berry sign in her eyes instantly disappeared. Once she had calmed down, she noticed Luffy who was sitting on the railing as he stared at the vast ocean alone. Thinking about a certain Viva card, Nami shook her head before making her way towards her captain without further thinking. They all knew that Luffy was the one who was the most worried about the unknown situation of his big brother, Ace, even though he was the one who told them not to worry about it. Luffy. She called out to him. Are you sure about this? Knowing what she was referring to, Luffy assured her that it was fine and that she really didn't have to worry about it at all. But of course, she wasn't convinced. Brooke, who was sitting not far from them, happened to overhear their conversation. Luffy-san, I don't mind taking an alternate route. He spoke, and the rest also gathered around them. The soothing sound of the violin didn't stop as he continued to speak. So far, there is no need for me to worry about how Laboon is waiting for me because what is more important is to live until we meet again. Frankie and Usopp both agreed with Brooke's passionate speech. Luffy, we don't mind taking a detour. Usopp claimed as Chopper cheered around his shoulder. Even Robin, Zoro and Sanji smiled, showing their agreement and support. Feeling touched with his crew's endless support, Luffy flashed them the perfect D smile on his face. Grateful for having such a supporting and understanding crew, he assured them once again that he was indeed fine and that they didn't have to worry about Ace as his big brother alone was stronger than all of them combined. He would surely be able to get himself out of whatever trouble that was holding him back at the moment. After that, with Luffy as the initiator, they ended up celebrating Brooks joining the crew for the second time under the excuse that Zoro missed out the first celebration. That day, they partied hard until late at night. The next day, the crew spent the day doing their own things. Luffy, Usopp, and Chopper were fishing as they sat on the railing with such a great concentration on their faces. Frankie was trying to build something somewhere around the ship. Robin was reading a book not far from where the youngest three were with Brooke next to her, 
as he played a calming melody with his violin. Zoro was sleeping at his usual spot, while Sanji was busy preparing lunch in the kitchen. As for Nami, she was busy writing some letters for her sister, Nojiko. A while after that, Luffy was feeling tired and bored from waiting for the fishes to bite his bait. Looking around the place to find something else that could entertain him, he saw Nami who was scribbling something on a piece of paper. Not wanting to fish anymore, he went to disturb his navigator. Nami, what are you doing? He asked as soon as he reached her side. Pushing away Luffy's face that was too close to her own face, she replied writing a letter for my sister. Nojiko told me before that I should write her some letters to make sure that I'm fine. Plus, with all of the troubles that we have been facing lately, if I don't explain what truly happened, who knows how they would react? Luffy blinked and stared deeply at some of the finished letters before asking do you miss her? Of course. I haven't contacted her or Genzo-san ever since we left Kokoyashi. She sighed, raising her head to meet Luffy's curious gaze. Our bounties must have been delivered to the village by now, so I ought to write some to them already. Hearing the word bounties, Chopper who overheard their conversation, whimpered when he thought about his value as a pirate at the mere total of fifty berries. This is not fair. He cried out in grief. S-H-H-H-H-H. Chopper, you're scaring them away. Usopp complained. The sniper then groaned when he witnessed that one fish that was as big as his hand managed to slip away after it ate his bait. Luffy snickered at them before mumbling to himself maybe I should write some to Nachan too. But I don't even know where she is right now. Thinking of a certain someone that was far away in the new world that he hadn't reached yet, he looked at Robin. Hey Robin! Yes Luffy? Robin put down the book that she had been reading and gave her attention to him. Do you know if I can send a letter to someone in the new world? Brooks stopped playing his violin and stared at his new captain in confusion. But Luffy-san, why would you want to send a letter to someone in the new world? Do you know anyone there? Now Usopp, Chopper and Nami abandoned what they were doing and looked at him questioningly. Even Robin had completely abandoned her book and said well, there is a way. But who exactly do you want to send the letter to, Luffy? My sister. Luffy answered cheerfully. My older sister. Shishi shishi, I haven't seen her ever since she sailed away to the Grand Line first. Last time in Alabasta, Ace said that he met her in the New World not too long ago. Man, Ace even got himself beaten up half to death by her shishi shishi. Silence. The five of them stared at him with their eyes widened. Zoro, who was sleeping at his usual spot not far from them, was now awake with his eyes widened in surprise. Even Sanji's head was poking through the door of the galley just to stare at Luffy with his cigarette almost dropped to the floor in disbelief. Eh. You have an older sister? And she has already reached the new world? Is she older than Ace? How strong is she? What does she look like? Is she as beautiful as our Nami Swan? Then I must see her with my own two eyes. But I don't have eyes anymore. Skull jokes. Yohohoho. What's her name? Although they kept bombarding him with strange questions, Luffy flashed them the big smile on his face and responded happily her name is Neru. Monkey D. Neru. Chapter 2. Introducing the Three Siblings. When she realized that she was about to go through her second life in a completely different world than her first life in the elemental nations, Uzumaki Nero couldn't describe her feelings well. She remembered dying in Sakura's arms with the rest of the original Team 7 there. That was when they were just done saving the whole shinobi world by taking down the enemies that also included a freaking goddess of all things. So when she died, she naturally expected herself to end up in the pure world and be welcomed by the likes of her deceased parents, Erosenin and even Niji. But no! Instead of the so-called pure land, she opened her eyes for the first time since she died only to see that she was in a very unfamiliar surrounding. And instead of the faces of her parents, she was greeted with the shocking sight of two unknown men staring down at her as if she was some kind of a weird freaking creature. The worst part was that she couldn't even move her body as she wished. She couldn't stand up. Heck, she couldn't even freaking speak. The only thing that came out of her mouth was some nonsense sounds that reminded her of the ones that babies always made. 
Suddenly, she froze at her thought. Babies? Nera tried to calm herself and forced herself to ignore the strange men and observe her surroundings. When she calmed enough, she noticed that she was laying down inside of what looked like a wooden cage but with nothing at the top. She wiggled her neck and caught a glimpse of a pudgy hand that she knew instantly was hers, but at the same time wasn't hers. It took her quite a few moments to realize that the wooden cage was actually a crib meant for babies, and that she was in fact in the body of a baby. A newborn baby to be exact. What the heck is this situation to bail? She didn't know what kind of face that she made at the moment, but the two unknown men suddenly started to talk to each other in a very unfamiliar language that sounded gibberish to her ears. The total confusion of her situation and the creepiness that she felt from being stared at by strangers suddenly awakened the baby instinct within her. So, she ended up crying. Her sudden act of crying alarmed the two men as they exchanged more words before one of them, the older one between the two, picked her up and carefully nestled her in his big muscular arm, while his other hand was used to wipe away her tears. Surprisingly, despite his rough appearance, he was quite gentle in handling her. But Nera didn't have the time to care about that, as she was still busy freaking out. What the heck am I crying for? And put me down, damn it! Shut up. I'm trying to sleep. A familiar voice suddenly rang inside her head, causing her to freeze. Still crying in the old man's arm, she responded immediately in her head. Karama, is that you? A familiar sigh she heard before the voice inside her head said yes, it's me. Now quit your crying. You're giving me a headache. Karama. While Nero was having her own internal struggles, the two men were still conversing with each other. This is the first time she opens her eyes and she immediately cried after seeing you. Wahahaha. We could not be sure that she didn't cry because of you instead. Ha! As if. Look at how calm she is in my arms. Indeed. The baby in his arm actually stopped crying when she felt the comforting feeling of being rocked back and forth. Of course, it mainly had to do with Karama's familiar presence that put her at ease, but she did feel some kind of a connection with these two strangers. Considering her situation, she wondered if these two had some kind of a relation with this body, her new body. The realization that she was starting to accept her reality in a short time kind of disturbed her a little bit, but at least she was calm now. The two men then continued to talk to each other in that unfamiliar language. Nehru, who obviously couldn't understand them, chose to observe them carefully. The one who was holding her was obviously older than the other one. He had some gray strands among his black hair, a beard and a scar over his left eye. The other man had long unruly black hair, and he had a red tattoo on the right side of his face. Both had that fierceness in their eyes, but even that couldn't hide the warm affection that she could see in them. Suddenly, she yawned as she scolded this body for being so weak and for getting tired so easily. As her eyes were slowly getting closed, she saw the man with the red tattoo gazed at her with overflowing affection in his eyes. Karama. I'm tired. Go to sleep, Kit. I'm here. You sure? Yes, I will always be here with you, Karama said softly. That was the last thing that she heard before darkness greeted her. Months after that day, Nero was frozen in shock when she finally got to see herself in the mirror. Taking advantage of the fact that she was now able to control her new body and now able to walk, Nero went to where she knew a mirror was kept just because she was curious of her current appearance. She knew that because she was now a child of another couple and not the daughter of Minato and Kushina anymore, she would certainly look different. But she didn't expect that her current appearance would be like this. What is this? You look ugly, Karama commented harshly. This is a serious matter, Karama. I look like a mixture of myself and Sasuke. Like I said, ugly. In that mirror was a barely one-year-old baby girl with a pair of big blue eyes. And there were also three thin lines on her chubby cheeks. In short, she looked the same. Adorable. And she quite liked it that she had the resemblances with her old self. Except for the black hair. Yes. While she retained the same shade of blue for the color of her eyes and also her whisker mark, she apparently didn't have the same hair coloring like her Papa Minato. 
Instead, she had completely dark hair. Not far from her, a muscular woman with long, curly orange hair stared in confusion at the baby who kept on scowling at her own reflection on the mirror as she made an attempt to grab her hair. Why is Garp's brat so weird? She wondered to herself, before leaving to prepare some baby food for the brat. Three years later. East Blue is one of the four seas. The whole room was filled with the sound of Nera's childish voice as she continued to read a book that contained the basic information of this world. At the age of three, she was already able to speak and read the language used by the people of this world. It was all thanks to her mentality as an adult and her strong refusal to use Kitty's speech to interact with other people that she managed to bring herself to actually study at the age of infancy. As she was reading the text as slowly as she could on purpose, she could feel two pairs of eyes burning holes at the back of her head. Pretending to be oblivious, she did her best to ignore them. At the door, two people were busy talking to each other as they stared at the three-years-old brat who was too immersed in her reading to notice them. To think that she is already able to read at such an early age, Garp said. Yeah, the brat started to read a few months ago. I am actually quite impressed. Dayton commented. Well, of course. She's my granddaughter after all. Wahahaha. Garp boasted before praising the woman for doing such a great job in raising his granddaughter to be a literate person despite being raised under the cares of a bunch of rough mountain bandits. Oh, of course. Nehru is not that hard to take care of. Ahahahaha. Dayton laughed nervously. She couldn't actually tell this man that nobody in the house was the one that taught the brat anything useful other than telling her not to cry and cause a mess around the house. The brat herself was so smart that she was able to take care of herself even without anyone around to supervise her. That kid literally just taught herself how to read. On her own. Then I'm sure you can take care of another one, right? Garp suddenly placed a hand on the woman's shoulder. Too slow to process the man's words, Dayton blinked. Eh? Later. Who's this, Grandpa? Nera asked with a perfect image of a clueless innocent little child as she stared at Garp with her big sparkly blue eyes, before turning her attention to the crying baby that the old man just brought from out of nowhere. Dayton, on the other hand, looked like half of her soul had disappeared into nothingness as she went to drink her beer to calm herself. From now on, he will be your younger brother, Garp suddenly announced. Intrigued, Nera poked the baby's chubby cheek softly with her finger. What's his name? Ace. Garp responded. His name is Ace. You can take care of him, right? Now that you're a big sister, it is your responsibility to take care of your little brother, protect him and teach him to be a good person. Nera thought that those things were naturally what an older sibling should do. So she nodded her head at them. Don't worry, Nero will protect him. She also didn't forget to answer in such a cute way, much to Karama's chagrin. She was having too much fun pretending to be an innocent human kid, he thought. Nero. Yes, Grandpa? Garp looked at this granddaughter, as if he was searching for something. Nero noted that the way he looked at her had suddenly changed. It was as if he didn't look at his precious granddaughter anymore but instead he was looking deep into her eyes as if he was trying to intimidate her with his presence alone. Forgetting that she was supposed to be a cute innocent little child who was only three, Nera stared at him back as if to say that she wasn't scared of his stern gaze just because he was a damn vice-admiral that was feared by almost everyone else. Yes, this old man right here was a very important individual. Monkey D. Garp was one of the two strangers that she saw when she first opened her eyes three years ago. The other one was supposed to be her father, whom she hadn't seen ever since that night. It seemed that her father actually abandoned her in the care of his own father, who in the end tossed his responsibility to a leader of a group of mountain bandits that lived at the mountain. Nera didn't ask Garp or anyone else about her father, nor did she even plan to ask about the mother that had given birth to her body. She knew that this world was just as dangerous as the shinobi world and the possibility of dying due to childbirth was a normal case in both worlds. So she didn't ask, and nobody made the effort to tell her anything either. Do you want to become a Marine? Garp suddenly asked. She blinked at him. Marine? Like you? Yes. B. 
Becoming a Marine like me can give you the power to protect those who can't protect themselves. You can even protect yourself and your brother using the power of the Marine. Here, the Marine Force was the military power of the world government. Garp was the Vice Admiral of the Marine Force who was greatly respected and also feared by everyone. She heard that Garp had been offered multiple times to move into a higher rank, but strangely, he refused. If I join the Marine, do I have to listen to anyone? Well, yes. Then I don't want to. She refused bluntly, before she resumed her attention back to Ace. Because of that, she missed the knowing and understanding gleam in the old man's eyes. Oh? And why is that so? Nera paused in whatever she was doing, then without turning to look at the old man, she gave her reason. Because I don't want to be controlled by anyone. Soon after those words left her mouth, Nera regretted her answer immediately. What did a three years old kid who hadn't even stepped out of the mountain range even know about being controlled or not? She was supposed to be a clueless kid for God's sake. But unexpectedly, she heard the familiar booming laugh of the old man and felt a sudden pressure on top of her head. She looked up and saw the grinning face of her grandfather. Ruffling her hair, he said all right, as long as you don't become a pirate, you can do whatever you want. You can even conquer the whole sea if you want to. Wahahaha. Then the man left, carrying along his laughter as it slowly faded away into the night. Silently, Nera touched her head and a smile slowly adorned her face. Then she laughed as she felt warmth inside her heart. Even the baby, Ace, suddenly let out a cute giggle as they enjoyed the moment together. Seiya keeping the spoon closer to his face, Nera coaxed Ace to open his mouth so that she could feed him the porridge that Dagra had made earlier. Ace obediently opened his mouth and soon after that, he could taste the fantastic taste of a solid food, instead of the usual milk that he often drank. Delicious, right? Nera smiled warmly at her baby brother. Her smile widened when Ace giggled as he waved his tiny fists in the air, melting her heart at the cute sight. I wonder if Itachi also felt like this when Sasuke was a baby. She randomly thought, earning a snort from a certain fox when she mentioned the Uchiha brothers. She ignored him in favor of giving all of her attention to Ace. TCH. Now that you have that brat, you don't even want to talk to me now. Karama snorted, feeling dissatisfied that he was being ignored by his own Jinchuriki. Don't be so childish, Karama. She shook her head mentally at the QB's childish behavior. Ace is just a baby. Of course I need to focus on him. It had been almost a year since Ace had been living with him, and he had captured her heart completely. Getting closer to her and not anyone else, Nera also wondered if the kid actually had a separation anxiety since he would start to cry whenever she left him even for a minute. She didn't want Ace to feel lonely. She hoped there was something that she could do so that her baby brother wouldn't feel so anxious whenever she separated herself from him. Maybe she could find him a companion. What do you think of a cat for him, Karama? Don't ask me. Another year later. Nero was five and Ace was already two years old. It was in the middle of the night, and Nero was trying to put Ace to sleep, when she heard a loud banging on the door. Growing curious, she walked out of their room once she was sure that Ace was already fast asleep with Nikosan, his plushie by his side. Someone was banging on the door, and since it seemed like nobody else would open the door any time soon, Nero took it upon herself to see who was the late visitor. She opened the door only to see her grandfather whom she hadn't seen since for at least five months, standing before her. Grandpa? Nero, how come you're still awake? Blinking, she asked what are you doing here? In the middle of the night no less. You could have just come tomorrow. What a cold treatment. Garp commented, but he didn't look like he was offended at all. After all, it was already this late, and the brats should be sleeping by now. Looking past Garp, Nero caught the sight of someone standing not far behind the old man. Who's that? Not knowing what to say, the mysterious man coughed awkwardly. Hello? With her sharp eyes, how could she not notice the red tattoo on the right side of his face? That was her father right there, all right. The so-called father whom she hadn't seen even once during these past five years ever since she first opened her eyes. 
But of course, she wasn't supposed to recognize him since this was supposed to be their first meeting. So she moved past Garp and stood before him. Both ended up staring at each other. Nero with her childlike curiosity in her big blue eyes, and that familiar face that reminded him of someone. And Dragon with his own awkward expression on his stern face as he wondered how to greet his own daughter. Both father and daughter stared at each other, and both refused to break eye contact first. If he thought that his stare was going to scare her away, then sorry to say that it would never happen. Don't joke around. She had faced so many lunatics before. His stare alone would not be able to shake away her stubbornness. With that thought in mind, she stared at him even harder. Or to be exact, she was actually glaring at him. In her mind, she appeared to be fierce-looking, forgetting that her body was currently five and not twenty-three. Therefore, she only appeared cute in their eyes. Bwahahaha. Are you two done? Garp asked, interrupting them in their staring contest. He was clearly amused with the awkward interaction between the two. Who's this man, Grandpa? That's your father, the Vice Admiral admitted bluntly as he picked his nose. Said father winced at his old man's bluntness, and almost flinched when he was met with his own daughter's judgmental stare, as if she was questioning him for being here. His father had mentioned to him before that this daughter was a prodigy and quite sensitive with her own surroundings. So far, she had never asked anyone, whether her grandfather or Dayton, who was her father or mother or why her parents were never here or there for her. Dragon was sorry, but it couldn't be helped. Hiding her here would be the safest option, and bringing her with him was not the best solution either. Hence, why he came to his father for help. After all, no matter how much the old marine disapproved of him, blood was still thicker than water. Plus, he might be at fault but his child was not. Ignoring the look coming from his father, Dragon awkwardly said yes. I am your father. You've grown since the last time I saw you. He winced at his own words. Of course she had grown. It has been five years. And based on the deadpan look of his daughter, she also thought the same. Then why are you here now? Dragon felt like his heart had been stabbed repeatedly with the sharpest knife in the world with her words but his face remained calm. But inside he was thinking about how he should answer her question. Even though his old man said that Nero was quite mature for her age and could accept any comment, he still didn't know how to respond to her question. As for Nero, she was having her own conversation with Karama. I don't think there's something bad about this guy. He's clear. He doesn't feel bad. When it came to the topic of her family in this world, The only people that she could truly call her family were Ace, Gramps, despite him always having to leave due to his work, and the Dayton family. She didn't ask about her parents because she learned not to look for something that had never been there since the beginning. Curiosity was the only thing that made her wonder about her parents once in a while. Why did the father leave? Where was the mother? Did she die? Nero wanted to ask, but seeing the barely hidden pain in her father's eyes, she held back her tongue. She had the feeling that the topic of her mysterious mother should be a sensitive topic for her father. Being asked that question, either Dragon or Garp could bring themselves to say anything as they exchanged glances with each other. Garp's eyes were telling him to answer her question, but suddenly there was a sudden sound of crying that could be heard, startling the three of them. Especially Nehru. This familiar kind of crying, don't tell me. Her eyes automatically wandered around to search for the source of crying until her bright eyes landed onto the small little bundle wrapped in a blue cloth that was currently resting in her father's arm. Huh, how could she miss that? In the name of Uchiha Madara, are you kidding me? There's another one? Even Karama groaned. There was already that one brat that wouldn't stop clinging to his jinchuriki. Now there was another one. Seeing that his daughter finally noticed the bundle in his arm, he cleared his throat and tried to explain. This is your younger brother. He was born recently, and his name is Luffy. Nero was silent. Dragon was silent due to Nero being silent. Garp was silent due to them being silent. Later. Take care of this one too, Dayton. Garp laughed as he pushed the baby into the woman's arms before walking away. Expecting Dayton to freak out, Nero was a little bit disappointed when the woman just stared in bewilderment at the baby, 
her new baby brother Luffy, before letting out a sigh as she accepted her fate. It seemed like the woman was starting to accept her sudden role as a mother ever since she had gotten ace after three years with Nehru. She didn't even get paid for doing this. Damn you, Garp. Poof. Yash. I did it. In the woods, Nera managed to create a Kaigab Bunshin on her first try, days after she managed to get access to her chakra. She had already planned to begin proper training once she reached the appropriate age to start. And she thought that eight was a good age, considering that kids go to the academy when they were eight. Before this, she had started in some taijutsu training to build up her physical endurance and stamina. Which was actually a good thing because she didn't expect that Garp would take a sudden interest in training her himself. After seeing that she had shown a good potential to be a fighter, the vice admiral took it upon himself to train her when it came to physical training. Needless to say, Nero was honestly surprised to see him using just raw strength alone to lift up a boulder which was a hundred times bigger than himself. That guy was a monster, and she could sense no chakra coming from him either. Actually, Nera didn't feel any chakra from this world at all. There was something around her that felt quite similar to a chakra, but at the same it didn't feel the same. She was still trying to figure out what kind of natural energy that she was surrounded with, and thankfully it didn't give any harm to her body. On the other hand, training with Garp really tested her limits because he didn't even have a single shred of mercy when he was throwing those punches at her. But she had to admit that because of those extreme training sessions with Garp, she improved quite a lot. At the same time, she was also having a lot of fun. Her grandfather worked for this world government, and he also had an important position in the marine force, which meant that he had to leave quite often for such a long time because of his duties. Nero understood that, hence why she always welcomed him with a warm smile every time he returned home. For her, Garp was a little bit of a mixture between Ero Sinin and old man Hokage. He gave her the warmth of having a family. Especially after Luffy came into her life, she thought that her family here had grown bigger, and every day was a fun day when she was with them. Thinking of her brothers, Nera smiled. After that, once she was done with her chakra exercises, she went back home. Just as when she went through the door, she was greeted with the sight of the six-years-old ace who was carrying a laughing three-years-old Luffy on his back. Nero. Nechan. Got anything? Dayton asked on the other side. I left them outside. She responded as she took Luffy away from Ace before placing the youngest boy carefully in her arms. Earlier she went out to hunt before she went to her personal training ground. Dayton nodded and instructed the other guys to prepare dinner, which they complied quite obediently. Hearing a ruckus from outside as they marveled over the animals that she hunted, Dayton ordering everyone, and her two younger brothers laughing with her, Nera felt warmth in her heart. So this is what it feels like to have a family, she thought happily. And of course, you're also a part of this family, Karama. Karama snorted. TCH, don't put me on the same level as the rest of the humans. I'm greater than them. And Nero laughed at his childish response. Years passed by, and Nero was now ten years old. Staring at her reflection as she combed her long black hair, no matter how many years had passed, she still couldn't believe that of all the bodies that she could reincarnate into, she just had to be a ravenet. Not like there was anything wrong with her appearance, really. It was just that, every time she looked at herself in the mirror, she was instantly reminded of her past life. If she had a pair of red eyes instead of blue, she would be the exact replica of her parallel self, Menma. Have you ever wondered why and how I could still have my chakra, or how you can still be here with me, Karama? She suddenly asked. Why? You don't like my presence here? Not answering, Karama responded with a question instead. Of course not. She denied quickly. If one thing that she was very grateful for was that, Karama was here with her, even though she felt that it shouldn't be possible. It was just that, the existence of her chakra when no else did still made her question everything. Sure it was a different world, but that still didn't explain why Karama could be here. But I was just curious, you know? It's weird that you are the only one here, when the others aren't. Once, she tried to connect her consciousness and feel the presence of the other eight, but she felt nothing. She could only feel Karama. 
That was why she thought that only she and the Kyubi were stuck in this world. She did try to relate Kurama's presence here with whatever events that happened in her past life that could cause this, but she still couldn't figure it out. If she remembered correctly, she died because of an excessive amount of blood loss from having her right arm destroyed. To be fair, Sasuke also lost his left arm in their final battle. She even remembered that they had to wait for such a long time before Sakura and Kakashi-sensei were able to find them. And when they did, it was already too late for her to be saved. Thinking of Sasuke, Nera sincerely hoped that the bastard actually survived. However, as much as she loved him like a family, she didn't want to see him again. Unlike what everyone else thought, she actually realized that the friendship between them was toxic, but she was the one who didn't want to give up on him. Nera didn't want to see him die so soon, especially when he finally admitted his loss and faults and finally agreed to let go of his revenge. She believed that he also deserved a second chance to redeem himself. And she knew that Sakura and Kakashi-sensei would be there to help him. And because of that, she didn't want to see him so soon. But that was also because Nera wanted to move on from her past life and live her new life as someone new without being tied to her past life. The sun is almost up. You'd better hurry up before those two brats wake up. Karama said solemnly. He could feel that his Jinchuriki was starting to get lost in her memory lanes, and that was the last thing that he wanted. Hearing his words, Nera looked outside the window and saw that the sun was really starting to rise. She immediately tied her hair into a high ponytail before quietly making her way towards the window, careful not to wake up her brothers that were sleeping soundly next to each other. Giving a brief look at Ace and Luffy, she then jumped out through the window to start her day. Not long after that, she arrived at her usual training ground, surrounded by nature. Summoning a bunch of shadow clones, she started her day by going through some chakra control exercises that she learned from Kakashi-sensei and Yamato Taishu. Being here for ten years, Nera learned what she could learn about this world. As someone who didn't know how everything works here, Nera started to do her own research after she mastered the language. She learned by reading articles that were bought by Dayton and the books that were read by Magra. Sometimes, Garp himself would bring a bunch of books whenever he returned from his work. That old man was more than happy to teach her everything about what she should know. Through Garp, she learned about the Grand Line, the people from different races and cultures, weird creatures, and places that she never knew could exist. She was intrigued about this strange world and thought that this world was indeed more interesting than her own world. Piracy, Sea kings that were said to be even bigger than a bijou, and even mermaids existed. How cool was that? Beside humans, there were also those who were born, raised, and lived in the deep sea. They were known as the merfolks and fishmen. She had seen how they were supposed to look based on that one book that she had read before, and she couldn't help but to think about Hashige Kisame, and that girl whom she remembered her name was Isaribi. She recalled that Isaribi was able to turn into a fishman due to the cruel experiment done to her. While Nera wasn't sure about Kisame, she was sure that he could also be considered as a shark fishman due to his appearance. Nera didn't know much about him, so she wasn't sure if his appearance was because he was born like that, or he had a Kekai Genkai that could transform himself into a fishman. Whatever the case, Nera wished to visit this fishman island one day. It wasn't just the underwater island, but she also wanted to travel everywhere and let herself go. For the first time in her life, she was so excited to start her new life with her new freedom. She didn't have to worry about being anything that people wanted her to be. She didn't have to reach the expectation of everyone because nobody here was expecting her to do something great anyway. Because she was just a nobody from the weakest sea of the world. Because of this, she could do whatever she wanted and she didn't have to achieve anything just to get anyone's attention and approval. And because she was a nobody with no special identity, she didn't have to be responsible for anything that was none of her concern. She had enough of it as Uzumaki Neru. She wasn't her anymore. She wasn't the shinobi of Konoha anymore, and she certainly couldn't be known as the Jinchuriki of Konoha, since Bijou didn't even exist here. Therefore, she didn't have to worry about any insane man or stubborn avenger to chase, or even a mysterious organization full of rogue ninjas that wanted to capture her bijou partner to fulfill their selfish desires and threaten her precious people and the whole shinobi world ever again. 
No more. Even if there was such an insane man or mysterious organization here, well that was unfortunate because that would be none of her concern. The marines could handle that. This time around she would make sure that there would be nothing that could stand in her way. Because this was her chance. Her chance to live her life as she wished. Once she was selfless enough to dedicate her attention and her whole life for her village, because that was what she was expected to do. She trained to get stronger, so that she could protect the village and her precious people, even at the cost of her own life. Because that was the way of a ninja. To risk her life for the sake of the village. Nera didn't regret that, but this time was different as she wasn't born in another hidden village. In her past life, becoming a ninja was her choice. However, she didn't choose to be a human vessel for Abijia. Even so, she accepted her role as the Kyubi Jinchuriki as what she was expected to do. While she wasn't treated as badly as her other fellow Jinchurikis, the fact that she was a weapon for her village was a fact that couldn't be changed. And this time, she would use this second chance to find a new purpose in life, and find the way of life that she had never ever thought of before. The journey of Uzumaki Nera had ended. Now it would be the start of Monkey D. Nera's. Jumping through tree by tree with a dead boar in one hand, Nera was amazed at how much she had achieved compared to the previous her. Of course it was all thanks to the memories of her past life. One of the benefits of starting her training meticulously at such an early age was that she had gotten a lot stronger than how she was in her previous life, at the same age. It was good to say that the current her was a lot better than even a genin Uzumaki Nero. With the help of her clones, she managed to gain the acceptable skills for chakra control at just ten years old. At least it could be said that it wasn't as crappy as when she failed to perform a single E-ranked clone at the academy. But with her solid clones, what was the use of a normal illusionary clone anyway? Nero wasn't that rushed in getting stronger. It wasn't like she had to fight a strong enemy in the future, so she was quite relaxed in experiencing a new jutsu and improvising her other jutsus. Plus, knowing so many high-level jutsus didn't mean that she could just use them straight away. There was a difference in knowing how to do it, and actually being able to do it. For example, she knew how to do the Raisin Shuriken, but that didn't mean that her young body would be able to handle the stress of using that jutsu. Plus, she was also trying to get adapted to the pure energy around her. One day, she realized that when she was using her chakra for the first time here, she could use the natural energy around her just the same as when she was using the natural energy in the previous world. Needless to say, she was amazed and couldn't wait to see if she could use sage mode with the natural energy around here. She could do that later. No hurry. She had years ahead to train her body as she wanted. Musing over thoughts, she noticed that she was almost home. Hunting after training was what she always did every day. It was also good that animals here were even bigger and stronger than the animals that she found in the forest of death. Wild and dangerous, they had become her regular sparring partners. Of course, they couldn't be compared to her favorite sparring partner, Garp. Like she said, that man was a monster. The fact that she didn't die from all of his attacks was all thanks to her agility and senses to dodge. One day, the old man asked her if she knew anything about this thing called hockey much to her confusion because she had never even heard of that thing before. Seeing that she was genuinely confused, Garp then explained to her about hockey and even demonstrated to her on how to use it. In conclusion, hockey was just another version of chakra of this world. Both had the same functions and the same feelings. Their only difference was that people here were not that dependent on hockey like ninjas in the shinobi world did whereas Chakra was her life force and she needed to unlock her Chakra coil at an early age to gain access to it. Haki was not the same as Chakra. Everyone had spiritual energy, but Haki was not necessary for them to survive. Anyone could learn Haki no matter how old they were. And they didn't use Haki just like how the people of the elemental nations utilized their Chakra. No, they only used Haki to strengthen their attack just like how her grandpa Garp used hockey to make his punches even stronger. She had seen his entire arm turn shiny black as he used his hockey. He said that this type of hockey was called the Byusashoka hockey. It was basically how Sakura and Tsunade Bachan used their chakra to gain their super strength. That type of hockey could also be used to strengthen their weapons and defenses. 
The second type was Kenbun Shukuhaki. Just like how she used her chakra to sense people's presence, emotions, and intentions, the same things could also be done using this type of haki. It was also because she was able to dodge Garp's attacks that he thought that she somehow managed to awaken her haki. Though, she didn't deny his words. Being able to use haki was a perfect cover for her advanced abilities. And the last one was Haushuku Haki, which was a rare type of haki that only few in millions could use. Unfortunately, Garp didn't elaborate more about this haki. But she did notice that the way he looked at her that day was definitely different, much to her confusion. Gramps said that he will come back soon. I wonder how long will I be able to last against him this time. She thought. If you're defeated again, I will be so embarrassed to call you my Jinchuriki. Hey. You can't blame me. That guy is way stronger than me. You can feel his strength too, right, Karama? Kit, it's not impossible for you to beat him one day. He encouraged her, much to her surprise. But you're indeed right. I can feel the tremendous amount of power from him. More specifically, his raw power. It wasn't just his raw power alone, but even his presence and aura were worthy enough to be noticed by the QB. It's quite interesting around here, isn't it? Can you imagine that out there exists a creature that is even bigger than you? Perhaps even a hundred times more. She teased him with a smirk. It doesn't matter how big are the creatures called seekings that the books claim to be. I am not going to be easily defeated by a creature that couldn't even talk. Karama haughtily declared. There was a hint of annoyance and pride that she could detect from his voice alone. I would like to see it with my own eyes as to how strong the creatures are here. So for our sake, you might as well just leave this place sooner. Just for how long are you planning to stay here anyway? Soon, Karama. She responded with her eyes gleaming with determination. It wasn't like she didn't want to leave this place sooner, but she thought that it was better if she could wait for at least a couple of years more. Like she said, there was no hurry. She should enjoy her childhood with her siblings first before she started on her journey. Plus, she also had her own plans. Now it's not the right time. Give me another two years, then we can travel to the Grand Line, she said, earning a snort from the grumpy old fox until there was nothing more that she could hear from her head. That was the end of their conversation. Just then, she saw the familiar house that she grew up in. Slowing down her movement, she landed gracefully in front of the open door. Dropping off the dead boar outside, she then walked inside. You're finally back? Nera turned to her side and saw a huge masculine woman with orange hair sitting on the floor as she smoked a cigarette. This was the woman who raised her from babyhood until now. Despite her rough and vulgar way of speaking, she was actually a nice person. She also happened to be a leader of a group of mountain bandits. Curly Dayton? Nero had good opinions of her. Yeah, I caught a boar earlier. It would be nice if we could have some roasted meat tonight, she suggested. When she noticed the lack of noise in the house, she knew that her two brothers were not here. Where are the boys? The usual. Dayton shrugged her shoulders as she looked at the young girl that she was forced to take care of alongside another two troublesome brats. I'm surprised you three didn't return together. Usually, those two brats would be following you anywhere you go. Not today. I need some alone times for myself too, you know? Plus, with them being around me, there's no way I can finish my training smoothly. Training, training, training. All you ever do is train your ass off. I hope you didn't destroy another part of the forest, or else I would get another complaint from the town's mayor because of you, you damn girl. Dayton scolded her with a scowl. That was just one time. Nera pouted at her, before she paused for a moment, and grinned at the older woman. Plus, if I want to destroy the forest, Emma do it with a loud bang. Snickering to herself, she left the house before Dayton could nag at her even more. Using her chakra to locate her two brothers, a chuckle escaped her mouth as she leapt off the ground and started to jump on the tree by tree, heading towards a certain direction. Soon, she arrived at a riverside, which was the spot where the three of them always spent their time fishing. Her two troublemakers were nowhere to be seen though. But that didn't mean that they were not somewhere around here. In fact, she could sense Ace's presence behind that one tree a few feet away from her left, while Luffy didn't even bother to hide his laughter 
as he hid himself poorly in a bush on her right. Hearing a quiet one, two, three, she was then ambushed by the two of them as they let out such a loud battle cry. Mary just stood there like a wood before she simply moved a couple of steps backwards. Her sudden movement caused the two to bump their heads against each other with a loud thud. Owl. That hurts. You should hide better next time. She grinned teasingly at them. Ace, who was rubbing his head, then pointed a finger at Luffy. It's because Luffy didn't hide properly. But Ace, you could have been quieter. Luffy responded back with such an innocent look that it made the older boy speechless and narrowed to laugh even harder. All right, that's enough. Don't tell me you guys were just playing around and didn't get any fish at all. That's not true. I got three, Luffy said proudly before he went to collect the fishes that he managed to catch. Aha! Ace exclaimed with a look of pride as he showed off a big fish that was twice his size. Look at what I got, Nero. Me too. Me too, yelled Luffy when he came back while hugging a total of three fishes that were as big as his arm each. With a bright smile, he asked her what did you get, Nachon? I got a huge boar, she said while patting his head, before she went to ruffle Ace's hair, earning a cute scowl from the seven years old. Tonight, we're going to eat some roasted meat. The boys cheered. Then Luffy asked where did you go, Nachon? You just missed how me and Ace caught the fish with our bare hands. Were you training again? Ace asked. Uh Uh-huh. She nodded to Ace before turning to look at Luffy. It's Ace and I, Luffy, not me and Ace. The response that she got was a look that said that's what I said from him. Ah, why didn't you bring us with you? Luffy pouted. Grinning, she said don't worry. Soon I'll guarantee that you two will be able to get some training too. Confused, Luffy asked what she meant by that while Ace was starting to have a bad feeling. Oh, you don't know? Gramps is coming home soon. She stated with a look of innocence, as if she didn't know these two were most afraid of their own grandfather. And just as she thought, when the boys heard the word Gramps, their faces went pale. Because if Gramps was here, it meant that they would be getting the infamous fist of love. Chapter 3 Grandpa Garp Gramps is really coming home? This is bad. We need to hide. Looking at the two children panicking as if it was the end of the world, Nero couldn't help but burst into a fit of laughter. Why are the two of you even that afraid of Gramps? He isn't even that bad. I don't want to get another fist of love. It hurts. Luffy complained as he placed both of his hands over his head, as if Garp would appear out of nowhere with his fists ready to punch him into the ground. Even you, Ace? She took a glance at Ace and noticed the unwillingness reflected in his eyes that told her exactly how he felt about the thought of their grandfather coming home. Well, she couldn't blame them for that at all. If Nair was a normal kid like her brothers, she would certainly be pressured and scared of Garp as well. But since she wasn't a real kid to begin with, she actually found those training with their grandfather to be quite fun and enjoyable. She actually looked forward every time the old marine was coming home because only then would she be able to measure her own strength against a monster like Garp and see how much she had improved. After the old man had seen her promising potential as a fighter, Garp expected the same when it came to Ace and Luffy. Just like how she was trained by Garp, Ace and Luffy were also forced to be included in what the old man claimed to be their family bonding time. However, unlike her, her two younger brothers were still unable to withstand their grandfather's so-called fist of love. Especially poor young Luffy who still had no skill nor ability to dodge or even fight back on his own. Well, to be fair, Luffy was punched and hit on the head light enough for the boy to survive. As for Ace, he was a fast learner. When he was younger, that boy used to watch her and Garp sparring with each other quite often. By watching them, he was able to learn and adapt well to the techniques that she used in her training with Garp. He also had quite a good instinct, as he was able to somewhat predict Garp's attacks sometimes. But fortunately for them, their training was not as harsh as hers. After all, they didn't have a natural healing ability and an ancient old fox with them that could heal their injuries. Plus, Nero would be there to supervise them so that nothing could go wrong. Garp put the boys through his hellish training under the excuse that they would grow strong and become great marines like him. They refused, of course, 
but unlike when the old man accepted his granddaughter's refusal to join the marine, he was quite firm with his words this time around as he didn't accept the boy's refusal. One day, the three of them argued and the boys ended up getting the infamous fist of love. But no matter how much they had been beaten up by Garp, that didn't stop them from expressing their strong will to go against the vice admiral. That was the reason why they had been constantly on the receiving end of the old man's fist of love, much to the boy's own miseries. As a result, they always seemed reluctant about their grandfather's return. After she had calmed down the kids, the trio returned back home, with two of them in a gloomy mood. That night, as they were waiting for the food to be prepared, the three siblings decided to climb up the rooftop and waited for their dinner to be done as the boys listened to Nera's storytelling. With Luffy sitting on her lap and Ace sitting beside her, she decided to tell them a story of her past life. And so the great Rikudo Sanin used the power of his imagination to create nine different creatures with different numbers of tails. Then, he breathes life into them, and just like that, all nine beaches came to life. The way she changed the tone of her voice to add more dramatic effect made the story even more interesting to the children. Whoa! Luffy gaped in amazement, before he went to tug on her shirt and asked eagerly then, which one is the strongest? Of course it's the one with the most tails, right, Nehru? Ace glanced at her expectantly. The brat is right. Karama shamelessly agreed. Well, it's hard to say which one is the strongest. Nehru said as she pretended to think of Luffy's question carefully. Excuse me. Karama somehow felt very offended and betrayed by his own Jinchuriki. Ignoring Karama's scornful look that he showed her via their telepathy communication, she added each one of them is special in their own ways. They have their own special abilities and characteristics. They also have their own names and feelings. They can speak and feel emotions just as we do. So all I can say is that all of them are strong. In their own ways. For me, you're the best, Karama. She also didn't forget to cheer him up. Hmph. He huffed in response, but didn't say anything to disagree with her at all. They have names? Ace asked curiously. What are their names? May I? She asked the Bijou first. TCH. Do as you like. Smiling, Nera then continued by telling Ace and Luffy the names of all nine Bijus, starting from Shikaku the Achibi. Why are their names so hard? I can't remember. Luffy groaned once she was done. I remember all of their names, Nero. Ace claimed with pride shining in his eyes, before staring at Luffy how could you forget about something that you were just told a moment ago. You can't blame me. The names are just too hard for me to remember. Luffy pouted, showing them his chubby cheeks. Don't worry, Luffy. There's actually a song about them. Nero told them. Really? Feeling baffled, the QB wondered, when did a song about the Bijus even come out? He had never even heard about one before. Really? I like songs. Luffy cheered, while Ace also seemed interested. Well then she started. 1. Dozing off more than humans, Shikaku she made one clone disguised as mini Shikaku on her palms. A sandy raccoon with one tail appeared. 2. Burning with fire, Matatabi a blue cat creature waving her two tails on her palms. 3. Leave the water to him, Isabu a turtle with a tough-looking shell greeted Ace and Luffy. 4. Hot as lava, Son Goku the turtle changed into a red monkey with four tails. 5. Always on the run, Koko a white creature with five tails replaced the monkey. 6. Not overdoing it, and not in a hurry, Saiken a slug with short arms and six tails swaying gently on her palms. 7. The flying leaf insect, Komi the slug then turned into a flying beetle with seven tails, making Luffy's eyes brightened. 8. We as expected, Gyuki a creature with eight tentacles spinning on her palms. 9. Past and present almighty, Karama lastly, a fox with nine swaying tails appeared majestically on her palms, pleasing the QB inside her. All the tail beasts have gathered together magnificently then she put down the clone disguised as Karama, and the other bijus also appeared in a poof of smoke. They are a little difficult, but they're good names. They all have splendid names, all nine of them swayed side by side, following the tone of her voice. They all have fantastic names. 
She ended the song with all nine of the bijus posing proudly in line. As soon as the song ended, Ace and Luffy marveled over the mini version of the bijus. Then poof. They disappeared in a puff of smoke. What do you think? Why am I so small there? Karama complained, but secretly pleased with the song. That was great. Luffy clapped his hands excitedly. Do they really exist? Ace asked. Nera thought for a while, before she answered with a yes. While the others were not here, there was Karama at least. Perhaps one day, that old fox would be less grumpy to show himself to her siblings. Fascinated, Luffy asked will I be able to see them one day? Ruffling his hair, she replied of course. Right, Karama? I'll consider it. Him saying that meant he had already accepted both Ace and Luffy. Knowing that, she was so happy that she ended up telling the boys more stories about the Bijus. Whatever events that happened in her past life, she would recount them back to her brothers in a form of story. Of course, she would exclude the bloody part of her life. So far she had only told them about the legend of the Rikudo Sinin and the creation of the Bijus. Sometimes, she'd tell them the stories of her Genin days. Other than entertaining the children, she could also help herself this way so that she wouldn't forget about her past life. Moving on was one thing, but forgetting was another thing. Without her past, there would be no her today. And Karama couldn't agree more with that. Dinner happened like usual. Neru and Dayton were eating their food peacefully as they stared at the chaotic sight presented before them. The boys and those grown men were acting like they hadn't eaten for days as they fought each other for the food that was placed in the middle. Nero wasn't even surprised to see some of them got pushed away roughly to the other side of the room. Honestly, this was such a familiar sight to her that she couldn't even be bothered to say anything. She had been exposed to this sight ever since she was a baby, so it would be impossible for her to not get used to it. At first, she was quite skeptical over her grandfather's decision in leaving her under their care. But years passed by, and as she grew older and became more familiar with each one of them, she became quite fond of this kind of chaos. Honestly, she preferred this kind of loud and lively dinner over a quiet and lonely dinner. After all, family meant eating and enjoying a warm dinner together. When she was a baby, it was Dayton's responsibility to take care of her daily needs. The other bandits, although they could be a little bit harsh as they kept telling her not to cry and cause a mess, but they were very gentle and sweet to her most of the time. They would help to feed her and play with her, and even encourage her to walk etc. But Nera thought that they probably acted all nice to her because she was a sensible baby that didn't cause them troubles. It wasn't like she was a real baby anyway, and the thought of having to pretend to be her current age was tiring and too cringy for her to handle. Then, after Ace was brought in, Nera took care of him for most of the time. She fed him, bathed with him, played with him and slept with him. They were only two years apart anyway, and Ace was more comfortable with her than the rest. Then, when Luffy was brought in, Nera had to focus on him more since he was still a weak and small infant at that time, unlike Ace who was already able to walk and do certain things on his own. So in a certain sense, it was good to say that the boys were more dependent on her than anyone else. Even though Dayton and the others were bandits, Nera considered them to be her own family. Dayton was a rough woman who didn't know how to express her true feelings, but she was the closest mother figure for the three siblings. She cared about them just as much as they cared about her. As for the other guys, they were like scary-looking uncles that seemed harsh, but actually just a bunch of softies. She was honestly quite grateful to have them in this life. Nero was amused when she saw the pitiful appearance of her youngest brother whose food kept on getting stolen from him unlike Ace who easily grabbed one food after another like a pro. Clearly all of the running and dodging that he did during Garp's training actually paid off. Nei-chan. Luffy, who couldn't keep up with that rambunctious group of people, appeared in front of her. He looked extra pitiful with that bump on his head as he pouted at her. I'm so hungry. As funny as it was to see him like this, she also pitied him. So she gave her food to him, much to his delight. Smiling at the sight of Luffy eating happily, she then saw Ace heading towards them with a piece of meat in one hand. TCH. How come you were not even able to get at least one meat for yourself? He scoffed at him, 
before throwing the piece of meat that he got to Luffy who immediately gave him his brightest smile. What thanks Ace? He thanked the older boy, before grabbing the meat and returned his attention back to his other food. Even Dayton's food wasn't spared, much to her annoyance. The food is not going anywhere you damn brat. Do you want to choke to death? Knock. 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 Suddenly there was the sound of someone knocking the door. Without even needing to open the door, Nero had already figured out the identity of the late visitor. Wahahaha. Is it dinner time? A booming voice shocked everyone into silence as one big muscular man forcibly opened the door, causing it to be broken. They watched as Garp walked in like he owned the damn place, looking around the messy state of the house before landing his gaze on his grandchildren. Here goes the door. Dayton sighed tiredly. Arg! It's Garp! The others immediately scrammed out of the place with all of the food in their hands. Gramps! Nair greeted him calmly, whereas Luffy almost choked himself to death by Garp's sudden appearance. She hurriedly gave him some water while Ace moved closer to her as if he was trying to seek protection from her. Couldn't you just open the door like a normal human being, you damn man? Dayton glared at him. Garp just laughed her off in response. He didn't even bother to look at her, in favor of focusing on the children. As usual, his granddaughter was the calmest among them, while the other two were still trying so hard to pretend that they weren't that nervous in his presence. He could see some improvement in Ace as the boy was brave enough to actually stare right into his eyes without backing away. While Luffy on the other hand. That brat still continued to sneak some food into his mouth, eyes wandering everywhere but him. Like he had expected, the two brats were still sticking close to his eldest grandkid like a glue. What's this? Slowly, he approached them as he raised his fist, causing the boys to flinch. You brats still don't know how to greet your elder? Looks like I still need to knock some basic manners into you too, huh? Gramps. Luffy immediately spoke after he swallowed whatever was left in his mouth. He raised one hand and greeted the old man. Long time no see. How you doing? Ace asked half-heartedly. Ho? Oh, you don't seem to be happy with me being here. Garp raised his eyebrow. Ace held himself back from saying obviously. That's not true, Gramps. Nera suddenly spoke. The glint in her eyes caused Ace to be on alert. Luffy and Ace told me this evening that they missed you so much that they couldn't wait to show you how much they have improved since the last time you were here. The boys looked at her with a look of shock because of her betrayal. Well, more like Ace, since the slow Luffy was still blinking innocently as he wondered what his big sister was talking about. Oh ho? Really? With a gleam in his eyes, Garp cracked his fingers and stared fiercely at the two nervous brats. Nera thought that he pretty much resembled a thug wanting to bully some defenseless kids. I think that now is a good time for us to have some family bonding time, don't you think so? Ace and Luffy gulped as they slowly backed away. The next thing they knew, they were screaming and running as fast as they could to escape from the lunatic Garp who was laughing like a madman as he threw a tree at them. Bwahahaha. Is that all you got? Dayton. Nero? Luffy seems to be improving a lot. Are you sure they're going to be fine? Don't worry. As long as I'm here, the boys will be fine. Later. Looking at the sleeping form of her brothers, Nero shook her head. Honestly, Garp didn't even land a hit on either of them. Sure, he threw a tree and some big rocks at them, but she knew he purposely missed his aim so that he wouldn't actually hit the boys. The boys themselves were mostly exhausted due to all of the running and screaming they did. As soon as she noticed that they wouldn't be able to endure the torture anymore, Nera decided to take pity on them, told them to stop and go clean themselves before going to sleep. After making sure that they were indeed sleeping, she left the room to look for her grandfather. Following his presence, she passed through the many men sleeping on their futon in the living room, and went outside through the broken door that was caused by Garp earlier. Since the piece of wood had been broken, they had to cover the space with a curtain instead. Once she was outside, Nerys saw the person she was looking for sitting underneath a tree not far from here with the moon as his companion, as he sipped a bottle of sake. She couldn't help but to think that he looked really lonely at that moment. Kids should sleep early. 
Don't complain to me if you don't have a good amount of energy left for tomorrow's training. Garp broke the silence. Please spare me my life at least, Gramps, she said jokingly, before she walked towards him and sat on the empty space beside him. Even though either of them spoke, there was a comfortable silence between the two before Nehru opened her mouth. So, what are you doing, drinking here alone? Can't an old guy like me drink alone in the middle of the night just because I want to? Of course you can, she said. But I remembered that someone said that old people shouldn't drink too much, or else they would have some health problems in the future. Listening to her words, Garp ended up laughing. Bwahahaha. As expected, only my granddaughter knows how to care about me. Nera chuckled along with him. Then the silence came again. If you want to ask something, then go out with it, Garp said after a few moments. She hesitated for a while, but then she asked Grandpa, Can you tell me about my father? Why is he unable to visit us? Unable indeed. Despite the irresponsible action of abandoning his own children, Nera didn't believe that he was a bad person. The affections that she could see in his eyes when she first saw him stayed imprinted in her memory. Unlike Garp, Nera didn't have any familial love for Dragon due to zero communication. Even so, she always wondered about the reason behind his actions. Clearly he had the ability to come here just to drop off his newborn children, but why didn't he make any effort to stay in contact with his children? She had always wondered about this. Whether it was about her father's action or the mysterious mother that had never been mentioned even once, Nero wanted to ask Dragon himself five years ago. But before she could even ask him a question, he beat her to it by saying that he was sorry, saying that the situation was a little bit complicated and that he wanted her to take care of Luffy in his place before he left to who knew where. He really asked his five years old daughter that he hadn't seen in five years to take care of his newborn child. That audacity. For God's sake, she was almost eleven and she had only seen him twice. Being an adult mentally, Nera didn't really mind about living without any parents, but knowing that she had a living father who still chose to abandon his children really didn't sit well with her. After all, because of her experience in her past life, Nera learned how to cherish the family that she had right now. And even though Dragon was a bad parent, he was still a family after all. Since she was already an adult, Nera really didn't mind about her situation that much. However, the same couldn't be said about Ace and Luffy. Unlike her, they were real children who hadn't experienced the bitterness of life yet. The other day, while she was bringing them to the Fusha village to meet Makino, Luffy had seen some children playing around with their respective parents. Then he asked her if they also had parents. Thankfully, before she could give him a reply, his attention was distracted when he saw a big fish jumped out of the water. And since that day, Nera hadn't brought them out to walk around the village anymore. They boys seemed to understand and didn't ask her anything, which made her feel a little bit guilty. Although she was glad and thankful that they weren't as sensitive as she was when she was their age, not like she wanted them to experience what she went through, but Nera thought that they still deserved to have a better childhood, or even an explanation as to why they were abandoned in the first place. Oh? Dragon? Gar picked his nose, making her frown in disgust. Why do you want to know? I think I have the right to know. I don't want to go on with my life resenting my father forever, you know? At least let me know the reason why. She stared at him with a look that clearly said that she would never leave him alone unless he spilled the secret. Good. I like that fire in your eyes. Garp exclaimed with a big grin. Well, that useless son of mine is the leader of that damn revolutionary army. In other words, he is the world's worst criminal, wanted by the world government. Well, that was unexpected. Why? Yes, why? Why and how could this father of hers could be labeled as the worst criminal of all things, and what was wrong with the army anyway? It's a no-good army that wants to oppose the world government. In any way, don't follow his reckless actions. Nera still had questions that she wanted to be answered. Like, what was the reason that made her father lead an entire army? Why was he trying to oppose the world government? But at least now she knew that Dragon was a wanted criminal, then she could understand why he chose to send his children away to his only family member. Nothing was more trustworthy than one's own family. 
So I assume that he sent us here because he wants to protect us? By U.S., she meant all three of them. Just like how her identity, as the child of the fourth Hokage, was hidden to protect herself from her father's enemies, she figured that Dragon must have done the same. With that thought in mind, she finally was able to let go of what little resentment that she had against Dragon for being an irresponsible father. Nobody even knows about Dragon's full name, Garp stated. Which meant that there was a higher possibility that nobody even knew that Garp himself had a son who was also a big shot criminal that was wanted by the world government that he himself was working for. The irony. You're a smart kid, Nehru. I know you understand exactly how severe your situation is, he added, looking at her with that serious expression that was rarely shown on his stern face. The only reason why I chose to tell you this is because I know that you're different from most brats your age. I understand. She nodded seriously. Honestly, she understood more than what Garp might have expected her to about how dangerous it was to have a connection with someone with big influence especially when that someone just happened to be the enemy of the world. What she experienced in her past life taught her that no good power was fully good, and no bad power was fully bad. And she definitely knew that Dragon was not someone that held any bad intention regardless of his status as a wanted criminal, or else Garp would have captured him the moment he handed her over to him ten years ago. She didn't know why he was doing this, but Nera trusted her instinct and Karama's judgment. If her father decided to lead an entire army for the sake of fighting against the highest power of this world, then there must be something wrong with said power. But that was none of her concern. In fact, after knowing this, she was more determined to not get involved in any power play. Even if the world managed to find out about Dragon's connection with her one day, she was confident that she would be able to protect herself just fine. But what about Ace and Luffy? One day... She would be leaving this place, and what would happen to them if she wasn't there to look after them? She couldn't possibly travel the world and protect her brothers at the same, couldn't she? As she was wondering how to solve a future problem, a few moments had passed. A sudden chirping of a cricket in the background snapped her back into reality. Then she looked at Garp again. Might as well just satisfy her curiosity now. What about my mother? Is she still alive? If yes, then where is she now? Was she even the same person who gave birth to each one of us? Releasing a sigh upon hearing her questions, Garp gulped down the entire bottle of sake, before placing the now emptied bottle down, and said I can't say much about your mother, but yes, you and Luffy are indeed the children of my son and the same woman. What about Ace? What about him? You didn't mention his name. With a blank face, she pointed out the fact that he only confirmed that she and her youngest brother came from the same parents, not Ace. What did he mean by that? Was her instinct right all along? She recalled that when Garp brought Ace here, Dragon was nowhere to be seen. And when the man told her to take care of Luffy in his place, he didn't even mention Ace's name. Ever since then, she had been wondering if Ace was even related to them. But of course— No matter what kind of background the boy had, he would always be her younger brother. Ace is the son of the Pirate King, G.O.L.D. Roger, Garp said without hesitation. His mother's name is Poor Gas D. Rouge who was pregnant with Ace for twenty months before finally giving birth a year and three months after Roger died. She died soon after giving birth to Ace. Nera blinked, too taken aback to even say anything. Garp's casual revelation of Ace's real birth parents totally left her speechless. Actually, she was more surprised to hear about the twenty months of pregnancy than Ace being the son of the infamous Pirate King. Twenty months? How was that even physically possible? Suddenly, she heard a gasp. Both turned around, only to see Ace standing between the broken door as he looked at them in shock. Chapter 4. Familiar Bonds Ace Nehru exclaimed, quietly cursing herself for not paying attention to her surroundings. Garp didn't seem to be surprised by the boy's sudden appearance. It was as if he already knew that Ace had been standing there and listening to them for God know how long. I thought you were asleep, she said softly, but the boy didn't even look at her. Instead, he had his eyes on the old man who had just revealed his supposed birth parents' identities like it was no big deal with a look of pure disbelief. Is it true? That I'm the son of the Pirate King? 
He sounded calm, but the trembling of his hands showed them exactly how he felt inside. You want it to be false? Grandpa. Nero glared at Garp who looked like he couldn't even be bothered, before glancing at the poor boy. His eyes went wide as his body started to tremble, and this time was even more noticeable than how he pretended to be calm just a moment ago. Ace. Looking at Ace who didn't seem like he could respond any time soon, she was reminded of her past once again. In a sense, they were kind of the same. Who was Roger again? He was the man who held the title of the Pirate King after being the first pirate to ever conquer the whole Grand Line. He was said to possess great fame, power, and wealth. So many people in this world desired to find his treasures for themselves in hope of becoming the next Pirate King. Ten years ago, the man was executed publicly for the world to see in hope of ending the world of piracy. However, Roger's last words became the trigger for the beginning of the current Great Pirate Era. After his death, it was commonly known that those who were associated or held any contact with him were ordered to be captured and executed. Nero herself remembered that there was once a rumor about how the world government issued some kind of an order to gather every infant due to the possibility that Roger might still have his legacy somewhere. They wanted to make sure that Roger's bloodline was completely annihilated. She was one of the infants that were born during the chaos. The fact that she survived was all thanks to her father and grandfather. Plus, even as a marine, there was no way that Garp would hand over his own granddaughter just like that. Especially when he himself was aware that his granddaughter had nothing to do with Roger whatsoever, except for being born on the same day the man died. All of those troubles to make sure that there would be no second Roger. And yet, the child himself was safe and sound. Growing up undetected under the care of some mountain bandits, hidden away from the rest of the world that would surely demand for his head once his identity was revealed. Nera's eyes hardened and she clenched her fists. Just the thought of her brother having to go through the life of being hunted, judged and condemned just because he carried the blood of a dead criminal made her blood boiling in anger. Wasn't that also what she went through before? Being judged, hated, ignored and even discriminated against just because she was the Jinchuriki of the Kyubi? Heck, she didn't even know about the truth until that traitorous Mizuki fooled her into stealing the forbidden scroll before he ruthlessly splashed her with the harsh truth of why she was hated in the first place. Thinking of that day, Nera took a deep breath to calm herself. If it weren't for Irika sensei the third Hokage, and the Ichiraka father-daughter duo being nice to her, she was afraid that she would end up like Gara. And now, even in this life, her brother had to face the same thing she did. She narrowed her eyes when she observed the somewhat darkened face of Ace, and knew exactly what he could be thinking of now. Ace, look at me, she said, and the boy finally changed his attention from Garp to her. Does it really matter who is your real father? Looking like someone just shot him right in the chest, he stared at her with an upset expression as he raised his voice to his sister for the first time in seven years of his life. Of course it is. Why? she demanded. Are you upset because you didn't know about your father's identity? Mad because Gramps hid this fact from you? About your real parents? No. Then what is the reason? Why are you so mad after knowing who is your real father? I? Do you think just because you know that you're the son of the Pirate King, there will be a different treatment? Are you afraid that we're going to treat you differently? That things might change? I just... So what if the Pirate King is your old man? For me, for Luffy. You're still our brother. Our precious brother. It matters because it means that we're no longer family. He shouted. It was so loud that she suspected that his loud shouting had probably woken up the others in the house. With a heavy breathing, Ace stared at the both of them with conflicted emotions. To be frank, he really didn't give a damn about this so-called father of his especially his identity as the son of the Pirate King. He had been living well without a father figure, so he didn't think that much about a dead man. It wasn't just him alone, but even the one that was supposed to be his mother. It was strange to think about some faceless woman as his mother when the only females that he knew in his life were his older sister and Dayton. When it came to the role of a mother for the three of them, it was more or less Dayton because she was the one who raised the three of them from the beginning. 
Despite her masculinity and her rough behavior, Ace couldn't imagine his life without the masculine woman to nag at him every day. Therefore, the identity of this faceless woman as his mother didn't really matter that much to him. But at least he had to be thankful to her for bringing him into this world. As for being the son of the pirate king? Screw that. All he wanted to do was to relieve himself when he noticed that Nero was not where she was supposed to be. As in, sleeping next to Luffy. But since she herself had often disappeared from time to time, he just shrugged it off before he went to the toilet. Once he was done with his business, he heard some voices from outside. Out of curiosity, he went out to check things out but he didn't expect to stumble upon a conversation that basically became the turning point of his life. Ace didn't care about his real identity. The thing was that, he was upset because with this knowledge, he thought that he wasn't actually a true family member of them anymore. The thought that he originally had no place in their life was what upset him the most, rather than the fact that he was the son of Roger. Because of that, he thought that his beloved older sister was not really his older sister. His annoying younger brother was not actually his younger brother. Even this savage old geezer was not truly his grandfather. Annoying he might be, that didn't mean that Ace did not love him. His tiny heart ached. There was a part of him that was too insecure to the point of him ignoring the part where Neri just said that he was still their brother despite having different parents. Shoving everything to the back of his head, his stubborn ass still continued to be all upset about it even though he knew that he shouldn't be like this. But what could he do when the emotional part of him refused to listen to the rational part of him? He brewed. A tick appeared on Nera's forehead upon seeing a familiar expression that she had seen enough on a certain someone's face. If she let this continue, Ace would end up becoming a broody kid. No. She refused to let it happen. Nera moved and stood before him. Ace. Listen to me. Who cares if we're not truly related? I don't. Grandpa doesn't. Dayton and the others certainly don't. And I'm sure Luffy won't care about this little thing either. Because you know why? Seeing that he didn't respond, Nera grabbed his shoulders and forced him to look up at her. It's because of our bond, Ace. Ace widened his eyes at her, and even Garp was looking at her with a gleam in his eyes. So what if we're not related by blood? Just because we didn't share the same blood doesn't mean that our familial bonds are fake. But then, just look at Dayton and the others, they're not even related to us, but are they not a part of our family? Gramps decided to take you in despite knowing that you're the son of his enemy. Instead of handing you over to the Marine, he'd rather send you here, letting you grow up to be who you are today. A carefree child who grows up just like the rest of the children. You have me, Luffy, Gramps, even Dayton and the other guys. I know for sure that they all knew about you, and yet they still care about you. Ace listened to her words as she tried to convince him of how much he was loved, and involuntarily tears started to fall down from the corner of his eyes. With tears streaming down his face and snot hanging from his nose, he looked very pathetic at the moment. But that didn't matter. Sniffling loudly, he let out a cry as he wrapped his arms around her. Due to their height differences, as she was taller than him, his face met her stomach. He hugged her tightly like he didn't want to let her go. Nothing more could be said as actions speak louder than words. When she felt a damp area around her stomach, she just knew that her shirt was now wet with his tears and even snot, but she couldn't care less about that. Shaking her head, she patted his head before hugging him back. The slight trembling of his shoulders didn't stop her from saying you can cry if you want, but I just want you to know that no matter what would happen, we as your family will always be by your side. Even if the world is against you, then you can bet your ass that I will be there by your side to fight the world for you. So no matter what happens in the future, the one who will have your back is your family. A slight nodding of his head indicated that he understood. Nera let him be for a while before he decided that he was calm enough to continue their conversation. Wiping the tears and snot with his arm, he looked at Garp and asked why did you bring me here, old man? It was Roger's request that I take care of you, to let you survive. Garp finally spoke after a while. He did not regret that he just revealed a huge secret that would bring chaos to the world. With his abilities, he had already sensed the boy's presence nearby from the moment they talked about Dragon. 
Not exposing him was his way to let him know of the secret that should have been known earlier, albeit indirectly. Sooner or later, the children would need to be aware of their own heritage anyway. And since Nera had already helped him by asking about it first, the old marine went with the flow and decided to reveal everything. To be honest, Garp owed a lot to his grandchildren, especially his granddaughter. She was only ten, almost eleven, but she was the one who took on the role as a parent for the other two brats. Unlike other children, Nero had always been a sensible child that was aware of the true color of the world. Garp knew that she was aware about the absence of her parents even before she met Dragon. Her reaction when she first met Dragon was a proof of that. Even after Dragon left, she didn't ask anything regarding him, her mother, or even Luffy's origin. She just accepted everything and moved on. Her maturity to understand their circumstances sometimes made him feel helpless. Not all children would be able to accept their unfortunate situation as well as she did, especially when knowing that both parents were still alive and yet the children themselves were still abandoned. No matter the reasons for their actions, a child was still a child after all. And even though he was sorry, Garp couldn't treat Nera like a normal child anymore. Especially when she wasn't even normal to begin with. Before he was executed, Roger told me about a woman who was pregnant with a child. Her name was Port Gasti Rouge. She was pregnant with you for twenty months before giving birth on Batarilla, an island somewhere in the South Blue. Before she died, she named you Gol the Ace before handing you over to me. He explained while staring at Ace. So I took you here, and made Dayton to raise you, and now here you are. Alive. How did she even manage to keep Ace in her womb for that long? Nero couldn't help but to ask. She was genuinely curious about that. There had to be some sort of an explanation as to how a twenty months pregnancy was even possible. That was all because of her strong will to hold on until the end. He answered vaguely. Nera felt that there was something more than just a mere will. But since Garp looked like he had no intention to explain further, Nera didn't press him for more answers. However, there was one thing that she noticed. Wait, so Ace's full name is actually G.O.L.D. Ace? It's not gold as in gold Roger? Doesn't that mean that the Pirate King's real name was actually G.O.L.D. Roger? Nera looked at Garp in confusion. But Gramps, what's the meaning of the initial D in our names? In their family, from Garp as the oldest to Luffy as the youngest, they all had the initial D in their names, including her name. She didn't think too much of it, since to her it was just a unique family name. But after hearing Ace's full name, and the Pirate King's name, not to mention that Ace's mom also had the initial D in their names, she wondered if they all shared the same ancestor or something. Was there a clan with an initial D as their middle name? Garp suddenly picked his nose for no reason. Just consider that we and those with the initial D in their names originated from the same place a long time ago. I was right then. She thought, nodding her head as she accepted his answer. G-O-L-D Ace? I don't feel like using that name. Ace knitted his eyebrow. With disapproval written all over his face, he said to Garp since you have never told me about him. Then the man himself is nothing more than just a person who contributed some efforts into my existence. Since my own mother risked her life to protect me and bring me into this world, then I shall use her surname instead. His words certainly left no room for arguments. Nera didn't care since it wasn't her name. Plus, she also thought that having a different surname would surely be a safer option for him. She didn't say that out loud, of course. Suit yourself. Garp responded with a I don't care look on his face. Perhaps he really didn't care, or he also thought the same thing as she did. I don't want to drag this conversation any longer, but believe me when I say that you're not just the son of my enemy. I respected Roger just like how he respected and trusted me enough to take care of you. Just to make things clear, I didn't do this because Roger asked me to. Garp then threw a look at Ace who flinched at the serious look on the old man's face. He had never seen him this way before. Garp continued, Bringing you here, adopting you as my grandson, that were all the choices that I made. What Nera said was correct. It doesn't matter from which family you came from, but to me, you're my grandson. Feeling like he had said enough, he stood up and started to move. As he passed by Ace, he placed his hand on top of the boy's head gently, much to Ace's surprise. Then, 
Without saying anything more, the old marine removed his hand and walked away. He was probably on his way back to the village. They did have a house there after all. With Garp had already left, leaving only the two children there, Nerus spoke it's a long night, and tomorrow Gramps would probably beat your ass again, so go back to sleep. You're not even supposed to be awake at this hour. Glancing at the hand that was pulling his own as they headed back to the house that they called home, Ace smiled. And then, after all of the emotional moments between the trio, things went back to how it used to be. Nothing much had changed. Ace didn't want to hide anything from Luffy, so he decided to tell Luffy about his real parents. And just as expected, that little guy was actually quite okay about the whole thing. Both Nehru and Ace thought that Luffy didn't really understand, but nevertheless, he tried his best to understand. And when it was Nehru's turn to tell him of what Garp told her about their parents, once again, Luffy appeared to be quite chill about it. He did ask about what Dragon had been doing and his whereabouts in which she just responded by saying he's somewhere doing something. No need to be concerned about him. Luffy's response? Just a short MK, before he wandered off to play in the woods. Honestly, that kid was so carefree that it actually worried Nero a little bit. He had no worries, or he simply didn't give a shit. Nero would like to think that he was just too young to be concerned about their situation. She then made a mental note to teach him about having some awareness later on. Because being too oblivious and ignorant of worldly affairs sometimes was no good. As for Garp, after the whole Your True Parents episode, he spent another week here before heading back to the Grand Line. Apparently, someone called Sengoku had been calling him constantly, demanding the Vice Admiral to return back to Marineford so that he could finish his own unfinished works. The call was made through a very funny-looking snail that could talk and had a very interesting expression on its face that she believed belonged to this person called Sengoku. She knew that people here communicated through a den den mushi, which was actually a special type of snail. But knowing and seeing it for the first time was quite different. Thus, seeing her that excited over one, Garp decided to give one as her own, along with a slip of paper that contained the information needed to get a hold of him. After the old man went away, one of her brats, mainly Ace, had been going down to the small fishing village so often these days. That fishing village was the first place that she brought Ace and Luffy to when she decided that the two needed to experience life outside of the mountain range. Before this, both of them would only go there if she allowed them to follow her. Otherwise, they would stay put at the mountain doing whatever it was they always do. They used to follow her around like a pair of obedient ducklings. But one day, Ace suddenly claimed that he was old enough to go down the mountain without being guided. She didn't stop him. He could protect himself just fine. Nero was sure that none of the people here, especially in that small fishing village, was as strong as those big animals that Ace often fought with. Plus, her own disguised clones would help him if something unexpected that was beyond his control were to happen. They were only instructed to interfere if it involved a life and death kind of situation. This was also a form of training for her to keep her clones for as long as she could. They were in the village in order to gather some information. It wasn't just the village alone, but the whole kingdom had been planted with her disguised clones. Towns, villages, and even the huge castle at the center of the kingdom had her clones there. Because of her clones, it was safe to say that she knew almost everything that was going on this island. And what she had gathered certainly caused her to be disgusted with the rich people who called themselves nobles around here. Once, her clone had seen how a poor kid was being kicked away by a couple of snobbish bastards, while the others looked down on the kid with obvious displeasure on their faces. Although her clone was upset with how they acted, it didn't do anything. Its job was to observe and relay whatever it saw to the main boss. Planting her clones around the island made it easier for her to gain more information that she couldn't get by simply reading the books given by Garp and the daily articles. But when she spied upon the nobles and even the royal family of this kingdom, she found out that there were still many things that she didn't know of. For example, the structures of the power plays around here. As expected, the world government was considered to be the biggest power. The marine that Garp was working for was the military force that was said to be the sword of the world government. Other than the marines, there was also the Sichibukai which was a group of powerful pirates that allied themselves with the world government. 
There were also powerful pirate captains that were known as the emperors of the sea. These emperors were mostly known due to their terrifying strengths and their massive fleets. Even the world government was afraid of offending them. Together, they formed the so-called Three Great Power. Why don't you just create your own power? Karama suddenly suggested. You're not seriously thinking of spending the rest of your life by simply traveling and discovering unknown things here, right? The last part was obviously said in a sarcastic tone, causing Nera to roll her eyes. I told you, didn't I? I refuse to get involved with this world's power play. I don't plan to be used by anyone else again. That's the point. If you don't want to be used by anyone, then just be your own boss. What's the point of creating your own spy network if you don't want to create your own power? You're just bored, aren't you? Nera asked him with narrowed eyes as she imagined the fox with his typical bored expression. I've been hiding from you human beings, being sealed inside the three generations of your family. Then when I was finally able to taste freedom for a few moments to release my frustration of being sealed away, only to be used and targeted again in a war battling against those Uchihas and that power-obsessed woman. So excuse me for looking for some things to do to ease my boredom after being stuck with you again for the second time in this second lifetime. Karama deadpanned. So you're just bored then? She stated. I promise you, I'll let you out to play later, okay? That is to be expected he said. Then he quickly added, and you're not going to use me as your transportation either. W what? How could I ever have the heart to use you like that, oh partner? She said nervously, only to receive a snort of annoyance from the fox before he went back to sleep. In fact, she did think of using Karama to take her to some nearby islands. She hadn't set foot outside of this island range yet. Sure, she could just water walk her way to the nearest island, but she didn't even know how far was the nearest island anyway. What was the point of wasting her time and stamina to look for an island which probably would take her days to travel by walking and running on top of the water surface alone? Doing so would only waste her time. Nera planned to spread out her spy network outside of this island range. She wanted to create her own spy network just like how Jiraiya did. She started to think about it ever since she wondered how to protect her family here once she left this place. And in order to do that, she had to keep tabs on them and everything that happened around here first. After all, considering their identities and the chance that their secrets would be revealed, Nera wouldn't feel good leaving without doing any preparation. After all, she knew that there was no secret that could stay hidden forever. Sooner or later, someone would know. And Karama's words about creating her own power got stuck in her head. She considered the world government to be a huge problem one day as those people would definitely not let Ace live peacefully once his heritage was known. Not to mention that she and Luffy also stuck in the same situation as Ace. So in other words, the world government should be their number one enemy that couldn't be avoided, but still needed to be avoided. She didn't know about those Sichibukai or the so-called emperors, but based on their reputation alone, they sounded troublesome enough to her. She'd rather stay away from such troublesome people. Getting a sudden rush of information from one of her clones from what looked like a local bar, she curled the corner of her lips upwards. Ace was getting curious again. Ma, as long as he was fine. Nera had no intention to interfere in whatever it was he wanted to do. She trusted him enough for him to be able to handle that much on his own. With that thought in mind, she immediately got into a stance as she summoned multiple clones at once. You guys ready? She smirked. Hell yeah! Thus, her training started. At the same time, asking another person the same question he asked the others, he received yet another answer that was no different with the others. Huh! What if Gold Roger had a kid? Bah, then that kid shouldn't have existed at all. For carrying such evil blood, the kid should just die. I heard that after Roger died, a lot of innocent babies and pregnant women were killed just for the sake of finding the Pirate King's legacy. Nasty. Just imagine being the reason for so many innocent deaths. Shit man, if Roger truly had a kid, then that kid should pay back his sin. Roger probably gave his kid the direction to his treasures. Just imagine those treasures that the Pirate King left behind. Kid carried the evil blood of Roger after all. One after another. Question after question. 
answer after answer. They were always the same. Everyone agreed that he should die just because he carried the blood of the pirate king. After hearing the people here insulting and cursing his own existence, Ace felt so mad and upset that he almost grabbed the nearby wooden chair and beat these bastards to death. If it wasn't for Nera's lesson in losing your temper, means gaining a loss, he would have lost his cool earlier and did something that Nera would have scolded him for. Standing in the middle of the old bar while being surrounded by a bunch of worthless hooligans that only knew how to waste time, he scoffed at them before he walked out of that damn place. Even though he knew that he was accepted and well-loved by his family, he still couldn't help but to be curious of his supposed old man. He was also curious as to what other people would think about the possibility of the pirate king having a kid. But when he heard such cruel answers, to say that he wasn't affected by what they said would be a big fat lie to himself. He was only eight after all. He was still an amateur in the matter of masking his own emotions and feelings. It was good to say that Ace grew up well at the mountain. There, all he had to care about was playing and exploring the mountain with his siblings, making Dayton angry, hunting wild animals, and he could even sleep peacefully during the night. Even though he was always beaten up by Garp as a form of training, that old geezer had never said anything that could wound his heart. The same went with Dayton and the others. Even though he and Luffy had always ended up being nagged and scolded by them, they never utter even a single cruel and heartless word to him. So when he was exposed to such heartless and cruel remarks from strangers for the first time in his life, he was deeply affected. Being told to die just because he was the son of a criminal, no kid could handle such a thing. Sometimes he wished that he could be like his older sister who could keep her calm and never give a shit about others' opinion, or even Luffy who was too carefree to even care about anything other than eating and playing. But Luffy is still a kid, it's normal to be like that. He tried to convince himself. Taking a deep breath to calm himself, he comforted himself by thinking that those words were nothing to him. Their hatred and opinions were not as valuable as what his family thought of him. Other than his family, the others didn't matter to him. Because of the result, he understood more as to why Gark chose to do what he did. And he understood more that the hatred that he faced today couldn't be compared to the amount of hatred that he would receive once his identity was finally revealed to the world. Just like Nehru, he knew how serious and dangerous their situation would be if the world government were to find out about them. While being the children of the infamous dragon, Nehru and Luffy's situation was still better than his because nobody actually knew about Dragon's full name yet. And Ace would be okay if he continued to use his mother's name, and later make a name for himself. But for how long were they going to stay hidden like this? Like Nehru, he also thought that there would be a day when their secret would be revealed. And when that day came, it would be them against the world. So that was why he needed to be stronger. Stronger so that he could fight them for his freedom. Stronger so that he would be able to protect Luffy. And to be even stronger than Nera who could even withstand one of the old geezer's strong punches. Because by being stronger than them would he be able to protect everyone. He couldn't let Nera alone shoulder all of the burden of protecting them just because she was the eldest. Gramps was a vice admiral who worked for the world government. So he couldn't protect them forever. He might even become their enemy one day. The Dayton family would not be able to protect them forever either. It all depended on them. On him. And screw the pirate king. Why did he even have to be the one to carry all of his sins? To be hated and condemned by everyone. It was all because of that guy. Ace refused to be judged just because he was the son of Roger. Ace longed to be his own person. If he were to be judged and hated anyway, then he wanted to be hated and judged for being himself. There was a burning flame within him that told him to go on with his resolve. Prove to the world that he wasn't just the child of the pirate king, but he was he. His name was Ace. He would prove it. He would prove it by becoming the next pirate king. He would find the so-called treasure, one piece with his own abilities. He would beat him, G.O.L. D. Roger. This... He swore as gazed determinately at the ocean that was waving at him as though to tell him to come over and accept his fate as the child of the sea. Chapter 5 Introducing Zoro Under the scorching hot sun, a little boat could be seen sailing lazily in the middle of the vast ocean. Inside the boat, 
there was a single figure sitting on the edge of the boat while munching upon an apple. Staring at her reflection on the ocean's surface, she let out a sigh before finishing the whole fruit in another few bites. After that, she sat down with her legs crossed as she stared at the map presented before her. Based on the map, there should be an island somewhere. But she hadn't even seen a single land for three days now. Nera sighed loudly again. It had been at least three days since she had left Dawn Island. When she informed the others that she would be leaving the island for at least a week, she faced different reactions from them. Some nodded their heads as they gave her some advice on how to survive on the sea. Some frowned in disagreement as they claimed that she was too young to be sailing on her own, and some even threw tantrums as they wanted to follow her. Luffy was begging so hard for her to bring him along, saying that it wasn't fair that she could go on an adventure without him. Ace simply stated that if the two of them were going, then he would go as well. In the end, she chose not to bring them along. Ace, while he disapproved of her going alone, he still respected her decision and listened to her obediently. Luffy, on the other hand, had tried to sneak into her boat when he failed to change her mind. His attempts ended up in a total failure, of course. Fortunately, after a few words of coaxing, see ya, and a promise to bring souvenirs, she was finally able to set sail without any problems. She was supposed to land on a nearby island somewhere, but up until now she still hadn't seen even a single form of land around her. Despite looking at the compass so many times, she still hadn't managed to find her way to her destination. And no, despite what Karama had been telling her, she refused to believe that she was lost. He even got the nerve to call her an idiot with no sense of direction. How dare he? But that was not entirely her fault okay. The weather was just fine when she left, but who would have known that she would encounter a heavy storm not long after she left? The storm even messed up her boat's sense of direction. The most pitiful thing about her situation was that her tiny boat didn't even have a roof to protect her from the rain. The result was that she was soaking wet, and her boat was flooded with water. So yes, she was unlucky, and now they were lost. Karama's constant complaints about her being an idiot for being unable to use a damn compass almost made her ears bleed. And just yesterday, out of frustration, she accidentally dropped the compass into the ocean. It might seem like a hopeless situation for an idiot who didn't have a good sense of direction and said idiot's partner who was too prideful to use his own big-sized body to keep a lookout for any island. But that was okay. They were not completely lost. Why? Because Nera claimed to know which way was the west. And so, looking at the horizon, she picked up the paddles and personally rowed the boat in the direction of where the sun would set. She remembered that Magra once said that if she ever found herself lost on the sea, all she had to do was follow the direction of where the sun was about to set. The sun would always set in the west, and if she followed the direction, she would eventually find her way. Whether it was true or not, the only way for her to find out was to follow his advice, right? Idiot. Karama scoffed. It would have been so much easier if you would just come out and help me to at least spot any places for us to land. She snapped at him. It would have been so much easier if you actually knew how to read a map and the thing that points to the direction that you should go. He replied back. Oh come on, Karama. She whined at him. Do you really want to stay lost out here any longer? You're the one who is lost. He stated. TCH. If I'm lost then you're just as lost as me. We're both in the same boat here, Karama. She grumbled as she rowed the boat even harder. It is clear to see that you're the only one inside the boat, while I'm here in the seal. He pointed out the obvious. It was just a figure of speech, you stupid fox. She snapped at him, gritting her teeth in annoyance due to the fox's remarks. She didn't know if the fox was actually being serious or being sarcastic. Why aren't you coming out anyway? You were the one who wouldn't stop bugging me to leave the island, but now that I did and also in trouble, you refuse to come out? There's nothing interesting out there. Feeling fed up with the QB's nonchalant attitude, she stayed silent and didn't respond to his words anymore. Karama didn't bother with her either. And that was how they ended their conversation. Nera spent another couple of hours rowing before she finally had enough of it and just decided to let the current take her to wherever it wanted her to go. Sooner or later, she would find land eventually. 
But not even half an hour later after she stopped rowing, she saw a tiny dot not far from where she was. It didn't take long for her to realize that it was actually an island. Finally, with a grin, she grabbed her paddles back and rowed her way to the island while thinking that Magra was indeed right. Reaching the beach in no time, she observed her surroundings first with a single glance. Confirming that there was no human presence around, she quickly put away the boat into one of her storage seals that she had around her left wrist. Even though her Fuinjutsa level was nowhere near the level of those seal masters like Jiraiya or her late parents, she was actually not bad with it. Since sealing wasn't her main focus, she only used the seals for storing her belongings and to enhance her weapons. Perhaps, she could do more experiments about Fuinjutsa later in the future, she thought. Once she sealed away the boat, she looked around her surroundings and noted that this island appeared to be the normal kind of island. She didn't feel any special feeling about this place, and even the trees here were not as big and tall as the trees in Mount Kalubo. Entering the forest, she took her own sweet time in looking around the unfamiliar territory, and noted every single weird-looking plant and bugs along the way. A few minutes of walking later, she noticed what seemed to be a trail on the ground. Following the trail, she finally saw the end of the forest. Brushing away some of the branches that were blocking her sight, what greeted her next was a village that was surrounded by hills all around it. It seemed quite ordinary and peaceful. Nera smiled when she noticed some kids playing around as they laughed freely. Heading towards the village entrance to enter the village, she was suddenly struck with the nostalgic feeling of walking around the streets of Kanoha. Especially when the houses here resembled most of the houses that she was familiar with in her past life. Even the clothes of these people were the same as the styles that the traditional people of Kanoha always wore. Shaking her head, she convinced herself that the only reason why she thought that way was probably because she was on the hill earlier, as she overlooked the village. Just like how she always stayed on the Hokage Monument to watch over the whole Kanoha every day as she vowed to herself that she would one day become the Hokage. Unfortunately, it will never happen. She murmured to herself. She then smiled gratefully when Karama flared up his chakra as if he wanted to comfort her. Flaring her chakra back to him as a signal that she was thankful for his kind gesture, she then walked around the main street of the village as if she had been living here for years. Since it was almost nighttime, there were not that many villagers out on the street anymore. Even the kids that she saw earlier were being called out by their parents to come home for dinner. Since she was also hungry at that moment, she was thinking of finding a restaurant or any stall that sell food so that she too could have her dinner. But she suddenly stopped on her track when she noticed a green blur at the corner of her eyes. Turning her head to the side, she saw a small skinny boy sitting underneath a tree, hugging his knees as he stared at her with an obvious wariness in his eyes. Observing the boy, she assumed that he was a child of this village. He looked no older than seven at most. He had green hair, with slightly tanned skin, and he was also wearing shabby clothes. There wasn't that much of a distance between them, so the kid was able to observe her, as she did with him. The girl was obviously older than him, considering her height. She had medium-length black hair, and she was wearing a simple soft blue shirt, complete with a dark-colored trouser and a weird-looking pair of shoes that exposed her toes. What surprised him the most was the bright blue eyes that she possessed and the three lines on each of her cheeks. You're not from here, he stated. He knew that she wasn't a resident of this village, because he remembered every single one of the people living here. This was also the first time that he saw someone with such a look around here. When she walked towards him, his first reaction was to stay away from this stranger, as he remembered that old lady Nana always said to him, and the other kids that they shouldn't talk to strangers, especially outsiders. But this girl who was now standing before him was only a kid. What could she possibly do to someone like him anyway? With that thought to ease his mind, he asked her who are you? Hearing his question, Nera gave him a big smile as she introduced herself. My name is Nera. Like you said, I am not from around here. I was actually lost before I spotted this island. Since it was almost dark, I decided to come here. You're from another island? He asked, surprised. He knew that she was an outsider, but he didn't expect that she was from another island and not from another neighboring village instead. Yeah, I came from Dawn Island, she admitted. So what's your name? 
He didn't know where this Dawn Island was, but she didn't seem to be a bad person. I'm Zoro. That's a good name. She smiled at him, and he suddenly looked away, trying to hide his embarrassed look. He wasn't used to being complimented so suddenly. So Zoro. It's already dark out here. A kid like you shouldn't be out here all alone. Shouldn't you be at home by now? She asked. Zoro shrugged his shoulders and said I live at the orphanage down the street. Nero was taken aback a little bit and couldn't help but to feel compassion for the kid. But she was careful not to show any of her inner feelings on her face. After all, no orphan liked to be pitted. She was about to say something to him, but was interrupted when Zoro's stomach suddenly growled. Zoro blushed in embarrassment as he hugged his knees closer to his chest and at the same time tried to avoid eye contact with her, especially after he had seen the knowing look on her face. I haven't eaten anything since this morning. I feel like I can eat ten bowls of ramen right now, she suddenly said. Then she looked at Zoro. Hey kid, don't you know any good place that makes good ramen? I'm starving. And since you're the first friend I made here, why don't you come along with me? I don't need your pity. He hated being pitied the most. What are you talking about? She looked at him like she was confused. Then suddenly her stomach growled. Well, she didn't lie. She was indeed in need of food right now. Look, kid, I don't want to die out of hunger or anything. Then she caught something in the air and sniffed. Recognizing the smell instantly, a huge smile bloomed on her face. I know that smell. Without wasting any more time, she grabbed Zoro's tiny hand and dragged him away to the direction of where the smell was coming from. Zoro was too bewildered with the situation, he didn't know how to react. Come on. Don't be like that now, Nera said with a little laugh. I have little brothers too you know. So just listen to this big sister and accompany me to eat Zoro. Feeling dazed, Zoro looked at the hand that was holding his own and wondered what kind of weirdo that he met today. He didn't understand this person at all. He knew she was doing this because of his stomach making noises a while ago. He knew she was aware of his own hunger, but instead of being ridiculed, she was dragging him, a total stranger, to eat with her. Even though he was hungry, it wasn't like he couldn't just return back to the orphanage to eat his own part of the meals prepared by the patrons. But he just didn't want to. He'd rather stay out here and starve than return back to that place where the other kids would only laugh at him because of his weird hair again. He'd return there from time to time though, but only to visit old lady Nana. He didn't like the other patrons or even the kids there. So he always dropped by that place just to visit the nice old lady that always treated him with kindness. Not many were fond of him since he was considered troublesome, so if he really wanted to follow his heart's desire, there was no way he would return back to that place at all. Then out of nowhere, a stranger came and even treated him warmly? What was this situation? But, he didn't think this girl was as bad as what old lady Nana always warned him about outsiders. Slowly, his lips curled into a grin of his own, and he started to move on his own rather than being dragged around. It was also good that she didn't mention anything about the weird color of his hair. Later, both Zoro and the owner of the ramen stall looked at the young girl with their jaws dropped on the floor. Why? Because the girl was already on her ninth bowl of miso ramen. Slurping the last bit of the ramen soup, she placed the empty bowl aside, before looking at the owner who was the ramen chef with an expectant look on her face. Another bowl, please. Closing his mouth, the chef immediately went to make another bowl of ramen for his customer. This was his first time having a customer that could eat ten bowls of ramen in one go. Wow, you can really eat a lot, commented Zoro, clearly amused that someone could eat that much. She ate like she had been starved for days. Even Zoro, who hadn't eaten for a couple of days, was only on his second bowl. He wondered how long she was lost before she found this island. I could eat more, she claimed proudly. Right. He didn't doubt her now. So where exactly were you going? I don't know. Nera shrugged her shoulders and thanked the chef when a new bowl of ramen was placed before her. Zora looked at her weird. You don't know? How could someone set sail without knowing where one was supposed to go? As if knowing what he was thinking, Nero explained I was supposed to go somewhere nearby, 
but I got lost and ended up here. Seeing that she was still quite chill about her own circumstance, Zoro already considered her to be a weirdo. But he also admired her for being brave enough to set sail on her own when she was like what? Three years older than him? So how long are you going to stay here? A few days maybe? I'm not sure. Maybe I'll leave after looking around the place. This place didn't seem like it was worth enough to leave a clone behind. Even though she was planning to go to a nearby island, she herself wasn't sure which island was the nearest nor did she even remember their names. The names here were weird. Plus, with her own inability to read the map, who knew how long she would be able to return home, let alone sailing to another destination. Since she had decided to just go with the flow, then she might as well just stay here for a couple of days before leaving. Plus, she also made a friend here, though a little bit younger. He said that he was seven, which meant that he was a year younger than Ace and two years older than Luffy. Since he was as young as her brothers, Nero had no problem in getting comfortable with Zoro. Or maybe because he just had the same gazes as she did before she met the third Hokage. Nero wasn't sure, but she knew that the loneliness that she saw in his eyes was something that she didn't want to see again. But yet again, that was probably why she chose to remain here for a few days when she had no reason to stay here any longer. Little did she know that her decision to stay here instead of going back straight away would become one of the reasons why she picked a different path than her original plan that would later make her as one of the most powerful figures with big influence beside the three great power. But that was an event that would happen later in the future. After their dinner, Nera persistently tried to send Zoro back to the orphanage so that he would have a good place to rest. But she didn't expect that the boy would be so insistent about not wanting to go back and that he'd rather sleep in the forest. Nero was displeased to say the least. Maybe it was because she was so used to making sure that her brothers lived comfortably with enough food and a comfortable place to sleep, but she refused to let Zoro stay outdoors when he clearly had a comfortable bed to sleep in. In the end, Nero was proven to be even more stubborn than him. After being persuaded with a promise that she would see him tomorrow, Zoro finally gave in. But much to the kid's huge surprise, instead of walking there, he was suddenly being lifted off the ground and the next thing he knew, he was being carried by the older girl as she leaped off the ground and started to jump across the roof of the houses here until they reached the orphanage. Zoro's dumbfounded and terrified face was hilarious to say the least. Nera couldn't help but to laugh out loud when she saw his expression. After she placed him gently on the ground, Nero patted his head and told him to meet her on the place they first met, before she simply disappeared from his sight via ninja style. Landing somewhere in the forest, Nero chose a sturdier branch that could hold her weight and lie down. Using her hand as a pillow, her sight was met with the beautiful picture of the starry night sky. Her eyes then locked onto the familiar sight of the moon. I wonder how the rest are doing now. She spoke after a while. Do you think the others are doing fine? But what I'm talking about. Of course they are. The others were none other than her precious people in Kanoha. This place really gave her the nostalgic feeling of being in Kanoha. Not to mention that even meeting Zoro had reminded her of her past self. She sighed at her thoughts, and chose not to think too much about it. After all, this place and that place were not the same. Neru. Karama suddenly spoke. H.M.? What's wrong? Nera asked after she detected the seriousness in the way he called her. Serious Karama was never a good thing, and she immediately sat up. Karama? I felt a sense of someone powerful around here. Karama stated seriously. The presence was really well hidden. If I didn't flare up my chakra earlier, I wouldn't have felt it at all. And we've been followed since the beginning. What do you mean earlier? Nero rose from her sitting position and started to look around with narrowed eyes. She cursed herself for lowering down her guard and not paying attention to her surroundings like how a proper ninja should be. She was careless. This was a very dangerous situation for her if the one following her was a possible enemy and not the friendly type. Since she did intrude this place without any notice whatsoever. This place was probably someone else's territory. If this was like any other hidden villages that she knew of, she would have been captured and maybe tortured immediately. Using her chakra to sense her surroundings, Nera tensed when she indeed felt something out there. 
Her eyes grew wide and her heart started to beat furiously. This familiar feeling. A few seconds after that, maybe because the one in hiding figured out that its presence had been discovered, it finally revealed itself from the darkness. And Nera flinched. Meanwhile, in Dawn Island. After another chaotic dinner, Ace and Luffy spent some time on the roof. Usually at this time, Nera would have told them many interesting stories before they went to bed. But since she was somewhere across the sea at this moment, probably miles away from them, both of them chose to do some stargazing since Ace didn't know how to do a good storytelling like Nero. Stargazing was what the siblings liked to do every night. It had been like that for as long as Ace could remember, probably since he was a toddler. Then, they still continued to do so even after Luffy was added into their family. Sometimes, they'd do some cloud watching if they were too lazy to do anything in the day. Ace recalled that Nera had always pointed out some clouds that resembled some things in her eyes. Ace used to dislike such a boring activity, since he thought there was nothing interesting by watching the clouds. But these days, he often find himself staring at the sky and just watching the clouds with a light heart. The clouds in the sky reminded him that they were free in the sky in whatever form they wanted to be without any cares. Hey Luffy. He spoke, eyes still focusing on that one bright little star. It seemed to be even brighter tonight, he noted. I want to be a pirate. Luffy blinked, then he said, then I want to join you too. Nero would not let you, Ace said with a playful smile as he imagined the stern look that would be thrown at them once she found out that they were planning to be a pirate. Despite being stern with them, Ace knew that Nero would be supportive of their decision. Unless they commit some sort of an unforgivable action, of course. Since Nechan didn't bring us along on her journey, then we can just go on our journey without her. Luffy didn't mean that, of course. If anything, he wished that Nero would join them. It would be fun if all three of them could go on an adventure together. He was just throwing a little tantrum in an act of a petty revenge for the thing that had already passed days ago. Ace just shook his head, letting the younger boy be with his revenge against their older sister. When are we going to be a pirate, Ace? Luffy asked after a few moments. I've already decided to set sail once I'm seventeen, Ace declared determinately. Huh? But that's Luffy paused for a while as he tried to count something with his fingers. Maybe because he still hadn't mastered the art of counting yet, he gave up and complained but that's too long. Nechan would probably set sail for real first before us. He pouted. But then, she already did. Well, that's on you for being the youngest. Ace teased him. Just wait until you're old enough, then you can set sail too. Luffy then nodded excitedly. They both continued stargazing until Luffy fell asleep. Carrying the sleeping younger boy on his back, he jumped down from the roof and landed on the ground steadily. He then entered the room where they usually slept through the window, a habit that he got after seeing Nerid do it every time. After placing Luffy on his own mattress, he realized that his little brother never did ask him about why he chose to be a pirate. Sending one last glance at the glowing stars, he closed the window with a small smile on his face. The next day. Luffy complained about how it was so boring without Nera because they didn't have anything fun to do. So Ace decided to explore deeper into the forest. After discovering some new spots for them to hang around, they rested on top of a branch that Luffy found some difficulty in climbing up the huge and tall tree. While they were talking about what they were going to do for their future plan aka being a pirate without that savage old geezer of them finding out, Luffy with his dog-like nose suddenly caught on something in the air. What's up, Luffy? Ace asked. There's an awful smell around here, Ace. Luffy stated. Despite looking like he was slightly disturbed by the smell, he was still sniffling the air just like how Pochi always did. Like a dog. Sniffling the air lightly, Ace noted that there was indeed an awful smell around here. But it wasn't that bad to the point where they couldn't handle it. Clouded by curiosity, the boys slid down the tree with ease before following the direction of where the smell was coming from. A few minutes later, they arrived at an open area where they could see a lot of trash around them. The deeper they went, more trash could be seen and that was when they realized that this place was a junkyard. It appeared that this was where the bad smell came from. Beside the many junks, there were also a few dirty men with some worn-out clothes looking at them curiously. The boys ignored them. 
who would have known that there was a place like this near Mount Kalobo? Ace bet that Nero actually knew about this place since the older girl had once said that she had already explored the whole mountain before. While Luffy was busy trying to find some interesting things to play with, Ace was busy looking around the place. Don't go too far away from me, Luffy. Ace warned the excited Luffy with a tone that Nero often used whenever she was scolding them. Getting a nod in return, he saw a long metal pipe nearby. Walking slowly towards it, he was about to grab it when suddenly the pipe was snatched away from him. Hey! Ace looked up to see the culprit that dared to snatch the thing away from him, only to see a boy who looked at him back with a curious but mocking gaze in his big round eyes. Pointing a finger to the blonde kid, Ace glared hard at him as he yelled out some angry words. Ace's loud outburst immediately attracted the attention of Luffy who was nearby. You guys are not exactly from around here, right? The boy questioned. Your clothes looked a lot nicer than the clothes worn by the people that live here. He said, eyes judging the nice shirts that the two kids wore. Not wanting to answer the unknown kid's question, Ace also judged the kid back. The blonde kid looked to be about the same age as him. He wore a big funny hat with a pair of goggles around it. With a blue coat and blue pants, he actually looked like he didn't belong to this place either. Not like Ace cared, he was still busy glaring at the smiling kid. Yo! I'm Luffy! Being the friendlier between the two, Luffy decided to introduce himself first as he raised one hand in greeting. Then he patted Ace's shoulder. This is Ace, my older brother. Don't just introduce yourself to a stranger that you just met. Ace yelled at him. And don't tell him my name either. Finding their interaction to be quite funny, the blonde kid thought that these two were not that bad after all. So he introduced himself in return for Luffy's friendly greeting. Yo, I'm Sabo. We didn't ask. Ace muttered, still feeling somewhat salty over the fact that he was clumsy enough to let this kid take things away from him that easily. Sabo just laughed, not finding Ace's response to be rude at all. In fact, he talked to him back with a friendly grin on his face. Sorry for snatching this away from you, but this one is mine before I dropped it here before. He explained. Whether it was true or not, Ace decided to just let it be since that kid already claimed that it was his. Plus it wasn't like he was that interested in that thing either. He was just irritated with himself for being clumsy. Still, with its sundra attitude, Ace just said whatever under his breath. Still grinning, Sabo turned to Luffy since the kid seemed friendlier to talk to. So, where do you guys come from? Our house. So where is this house of yours? Dayton's house. Right, so where is it? At the mountain. Kalibo? It was the nearest. A nod. I see. Luffy stared at him expectantly, and Sabo stared back at him wondering what was it that the kid expected him to do now. Your hat is so cool, Luffy exclaimed. On the other side was the forgotten ace who was feeling betrayed by Luffy's instant friendliness to another kid. It was the start of a beautiful friendship. Hopefully. Back to Nehru. Staring at the, unexpectedly, an old man that was now standing before her, Nehru didn't let her guard down. She knew from experiences that even old people couldn't be underestimated. Just look at Garp and old man Hokage, for example. But Nera at the moment was feeling tense and nervous because this old guy had a chakra presence within him. She could feel it. There was no mistake. And his aura, his aura somehow reminded him of Garp. But instead of the wild and strong aura that she felt from her grandfather, the aura of this person was calm but deadly and even his old age couldn't hide the gaze of a warrior that she could see in his eyes, and also, the way he carried himself. Who was this old man? A person like her? Brat, calm down, Karama said. Being with her ever from her first life, he could definitely sense and feel her emotions better than anyone else. For he was also being affected by her emotions. Easy for you to say, she frowned. This time... Instead of talking out loud, she just responded to him via a telepathic communication between them. Why didn't you tell me about this earlier? If you would just calm down, you would have noticed by now that he didn't have any ill intentions towards you, he said with a sigh. Karama's words unconsciously eased her tensed muscles, 
proving how much she trusted the old fox. If she looked like she was ready to bolt away from the old man a while ago, now she looked slightly relaxed. Just a little bit, since she still didn't know who this guy was and how could he possess chakra. While people here possessed their own internal energy, or just spiritual energy, none of them felt quite the same like chakra. But this person right here, his internal energy felt exactly like the chakra that she was so familiar with. Not wanting to cause a problem for herself, she calmed herself before giving a somewhat apologetic and friendly smile as she tried to explain her situation to this seemingly weak-looking old man but held quite a scary aura. Being Karama's jinchuriki really did make her sensitive to this kind of thing. I'm old man. Well, she started off rather rudely there, but looking like he didn't mind being called old by her, she continued anyway I was lost and just coincidentally found this island to bail. I didn't mean anything bad. I swear. With one hand over where her heart was while another was raised as if to show her seriousness and swearing that she was actually the good one, the old man unexpectedly chuckled, surprising her. You're not from here, aren't you, child? Didn't she just explain it to him? She was about to say yes when the old man continued. Nor is the one currently residing within you. Won't your companion like to come out and talk? Just as when she was about to relax around this friendly old guy, she tensed again at his words. Not wanting to waste time by beating around the bush, Nera hardened her eyes. Now she looked more like her previous appearance as Uzumaki Nera when facing her enemies, despite the lack of blonde hair. You can feel him? she asked with a piercing gaze. Him? So it's a male then. He nodded his negative aura is quite hard to be missed. I detected your presence from the very moment you entered the village. It also didn't help that you two didn't even bother to hide your terrifying presence. Nera didn't say anything to that. It was indeed true. The only time where she would be concealing her presence aka her chakra was when Garp was around. But since she was alone for the time being, she didn't even try to hide it. It wasn't like there was anyone here who could detect a chakra presence that supposedly do not exist in this world, right? Yes to that, until she met this peculiar old man. Who exactly was this guy? Was he truly the same as her? I have no ill attention towards you, he stated softly. Maybe because the nervousness was very apparent on her face, he tried to be as soft-spoken as possible when talking to her treating her like how he'd treat his own granddaughter. She was now a little bit calm compared to how tense she was to the point where he was sure that she would attack him if he ever said something that would trigger her. In fact, perhaps what he just said a few moments ago did trigger her emotions. Nobody like it when someone else pointed out their hidden secrets, right? Come and follow me, he said before turning around to the direction of the village, leaving no room for her to say anything. Just follow him. Even Karama told her to follow him. Trust me, I won't let anything happen to you. A few moments of silence after that, she decided to follow after the old man. She asked, hey old man, what's your name? Surname Shimatsuki, given name Kozabura. Mine is Monkey D. Neru. He glanced at her and said softly to himself, soft enough for the younger person to hear anything a D, huh? What a coincidence. Hmm? Nera blinked questioningly at him, but the guy didn't say anything more. Probably just the wind, she thought. So where are we going? To my residence, we can discuss things there, he said. Nera nodded. What are you doing so far away from Wayno, child? Chuckling to himself, he then said it has been so long since I last talked to someone from my own homeland. She blinked. What was it again? Wayno? What's that? 